Hey Nick, what you been working on? Oh man, I've been working on some awesome stuff. I'm actually using reinforcement learning to train a race car to race around a track. Oh really? How's that going? Yeah, it's going great. Yep, great at doing burnouts. I promise guys, it does get better than this. Let's get to it. What's happening guys? My name is Nicholas Renaud and welcome to the reinforcement learning course. In this video, we're going to be covering a bunch of stuff, but basically the core goal is to be able to allow you to go from absolute beginner to being able to go and leverage reinforcement learning. We're going to cover a ton of stuff, specifically how to set up your environment, how to work with different algorithms. We'll also test out on some pre-built environments using OpenAI Gym. So you'll be able to balance a cart pole. You'll be able to build your own self-driving car. And then last but not least, we're also going to take a look at how to build custom environments. Something which is so, so important when it comes to being able to leverage reinforcement learning for a use case which is relevant for you. But all in all, by the end of this video, you should be able to take away those skill sets and be able to leverage reinforcement learning in a practical manner. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty guys, welcome to the full-blown reinforcement learning course. Now this course is intended to be a practical guide in terms of getting up and running with reinforcement learning. So ideally it aims to bridge the gap between a lot of the theory that you see out there and practical implementation. Now we're gonna be covering a ton of stuff in this course. So let's take a look at our game plan. So first up, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at RL in a nutshell. And this really talks about, and specifically in this section, we're going to be talking about how reinforcement learning works and learns, some of the applications around RL, as well as some of the limitations. Then we're going to take a look at how you can set up your environment to work with reinforcement learning. And there we're going to be using a library called Stable Baselines. Then under step two, we're going to be taking a look at environments. So environments are one half of the equation when it comes to working with reinforcement learning. So we need to be able to set up an environment and specifically open AI gym environments to be able to work with reinforcement learning. Then we're going to kick off our training. So there's a whole bunch of different types of algorithms available inside of stable baselines. So we're going to take a look at how we can set up some algorithms to be able to train a reinforcement learning agent. Then under step four, we're then, so once we've trained our model, we're then going to test it out and evaluate it. So this is easier than it sounds. So you can set up an environment and test it out and see what your agent actually looks like. Then we're also going to take a look at evaluation as well as how you can take a look at different metrics, how to understand those metrics. And we'll also take a look at how we can open them up inside a tensor board, something which I really, really like. Then we'll take it one step further. So step five, we'll take a look at how we can leverage callbacks to stop our model training once we hit a certain threshold. We'll see how we can use different algorithms. So there's a whole bunch of algorithms available in reinforcement learning. You don't need to write them yourself. There's a whole bunch already written for you that you can use. And we'll take a look at how we can use those. And then we'll also take a look at different architectures. So say, for example, you wanted to change the neural network that sits behind a particular agent. You can do that as well. But this wouldn't be a full-blown course unless we had some projects as well. So we're going to be taking a look at three different projects. So we're going to take a look at how we can solve the breakout environment, which is an Atari game. So it's, it's sort of like Pong a little bit, but not really. We'll also take a look at how we can solve a self-driving environment. So that's a car racing environment and how we can train our model to only have a picture as an input and train our car to drive along a racetrack, which I think is pretty awesome. And then we'll also take a look at custom environments, something which I think is so, so often overlooked. So this will allow you to get a better understanding of how to build an environment to work with reinforcement learning. Now, the framework that we're going to be using when we build our custom environment is going to be open AI gym. So I'm going to show you all the different types of spaces. Don't worry if you don't understand that yet, or if you're not too sure what I'm talking about, we'll go through it in great detail. Okay, that's our game plan in a nutshell. Now it's time to take a look at RL in a nutshell. So I wanted to include this section to give you a little bit of context about what reinforcement learning is, how it's meant to be used and some of its applications as well as some of its limitations. This is not going to be a full deep dive into the theory and the maths behind it. It's just a high level overview. So you get an idea as to where RL fits in, in the big world of machine learning and data science. So first up, what is reinforcement learning? Well, reinforcement learning focuses on teaching agents through trial and error. 
That's a really, really high level statement. Now, I know there's probably a lot of hardcore deep learning engineers that will probably go, Nick, that's not quite right. But it sort of gives you an idea as to how reinforcement learning learns. Ideally, you've got an agent and it learns based on the reward that it gets. So it tries something out. If it doesn't get a reward, then it tries something else. If it doesn't get a reward or it gets a bigger reward, it might try doing that multiple times. We've also got this thing called the exploration and exploitation trade-off. So again, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you sort of get the idea. Reinforcement learning is learning based on actively engaging with an environment. Now that brings us to how the framework actually fits together. Well, there's four key things, or well, five key things that you need to consider whenever you're working within reinforcement learning, or there's four fundamental concepts. So they are the agent, the environment, the action, and then reward plus observations. So think of your agent as something which is operating within an environment. So this might be a machine learning model, might also be a person or a player if you're working in a game environment. Your environment is where that particular agent is actually operating in. So in this case, say for example, if we take a game, so your player is operating within the game environment. So it's getting reward based on what it actually does there. Now, your agent will see what's happening within that environment. So say, for example, we're, we're taking a look at a game, your player will be able to see what's around them. So in terms of the observations, so it'll see what the game environment actually looks like. And then it'll also see what reward it accrues based on the actions it takes. So ideally, your agent might walk around the environment and might do something and might accumulate a point, might do something else, it might not accumulate a point or might even lose a life. That might be a negative reward. A really, really good way to sort of get your head around this is to think of how you might go about training a dog. Say, for example, you wanted to teach your dog how to sit or how to lay down. Well, your agent in this case is going to be your dog because you're trying to train your agent to be able to take the right action. Now, the reward in this case is you giving your dog a treat every time they do the right thing. So what your dog might try to do is take an action. So initially you might say sit, and the dog might not actually do anything. So in this case, it hasn't actually taken an, or it's taken an action of doing nothing. And in this particular case, the environment that it's working with is the environment with yourself in it. So in, it's trying to get a reward or it's trying to get a treat from doing a particular thing. Now, your dog will eventually see that it gets no reward because it didn't sit down. So it might try something else. So in this case, you might say sit again, it might then sit, and then it'll see that it'll get a reward. So ideally, it will then start to learn what action to take in response to the environment in order to maximize the reward. So it's observing the command that you're giving to be able to take the right action. So this in a nutshell is how reinforcement learning works. Your agent tries to take an action in order to maximize its rewards in response to the observations within the environment. Now, again, I just wanted to give you a little bit of theory. We're not gonna delve into this too much, but you sort of get the idea as to how reinforcement learning works. It's a little bit different in terms of how you might work with tabular deep learning and machine learning because your agent is actively engaging with a simulated or a real environment. Now, in this case, we're gonna be dealing with simulated environments, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. So what are some applications or practical applications of reinforcement learning? Well, there's a whole heap out there and there's only becoming more. Reinforcement learning is really, really popular right now because there's a whole heap of open world environments that people are trying to solve using machine learning and deep learning. One of which is autonomous driving. So you can see this picture up here. This is actually from an environment called Kala. So Kala is a really, really popular driving simulation, which allows you to actually train autonomous agents or perform reinforcement learning on it. Now, you can actually train a car to be able to navigate through an open world using reinforcement learning. It's pretty, pretty cool, right? Now, another great application of reinforcement learning is securities trading. So again, think of this. So your agent in this case will be like an autonomous trader. Your environment is going to be the securities trading environment. So ideally, what you're going to do is you're going to try to train your agent to make trades that are going to make you profit. So ideally, it wants to buy low and sell high and sell high and buy low. So if it's short selling. Again, this is really, really popular at the moment. There's a heap of stuff happening in that space. Another one which I'm personally fascinated by is a neural network architecture search. So what you can actually do is use reinforcement learning to build up a neural network for you and find an optimal neural network, which I think is absolutely crazy. So say, for example, you're trying to build a deep neural network to solve a particular use case. You might not know what the best type of architecture 
in terms of layers, in terms of number of units or in terms of activations is. You could actually use reinforcement learning to try to solve this problem for you. Now, this is obviously super advanced, but it sort of gives you an idea as to what's possible with the tech. Another place that reinforcement learning is super popular right now is in robotics. So training agents or training robots in real life can often be quite expensive because say, for example, you've only got one robot, it can be hard to train it on a lot of tasks. So what you can actually do is build up simulated environments of that particular robot and train that robot to do a particular thing. Now, in this case, the agent is going to be the autonomous model, which is training the robot. The environment that it's operating in, in this case, this agent, I believe, is trying to move a ball to the correct position. This is actually based on a simulation environment called Mujoko. So again, I'll show you that a little bit later, but we're not going to be solving that one today. But you sort of get the idea. So we can actually train the robot. The environment is going to be moving the ball to the right place. And the reward is going to be how close or how far that ball is from its optimal position. So again, there are a whole heap of applications. I've only sort of shown four there, but there are a ton out there. Another place where it's really, really popular is in gaming. So again, gaming is an open world environment. So the reward function can be really, really different each and every time. But you can sort of see how it can start to apply into different environments. Okay, so what about some limitations and considerations for reinforcement learning? So again, reinforcement learning is absolutely amazing and I'm fascinated by it, but there are some limitations. Specifically for simple problems, reinforcement learning can sometimes be overkill. So say, for example, we're taking a look at hyperparameter optimization. There's already really, really powerful models for that, particularly when you're dealing with simple models. But if you're getting to super advanced problems, reinforcement learning could help you out in that space. Another thing that it assumes is that the environment is Markovian. That means your future states for your environment are based on your current observations and there's no random acts. But we know in real life that there's going to be random events that happen that influence our particular model. So say, for example, you are training your Mujoko robot, right? In this particular case, your environment not, might not cater to people walking past the robot or knocking the robot. So you never really know what's going to happen in real life. You can only train in your best case scenario. So again, we can sort of deal with this because in our reinforcement learning model, we're going to sort of isolate our environment. But again, it's just something to take in mind when somebody asks you that question. Another thing to note is that training can take a long time and is not always stable. So we've got this concept called the exploration and exploitation trade-off. So ideally what your model tries to do is explore the environment when it's starting out, and then it tries to exploit it to be able to get the best possible rewards. But sometimes what might happen is your model might not have enough time to explore and might start exploiting too early. So sometimes we need to tune hyperparameters to be able to get our model to truly explore the environment and truly understand it. Sometimes because we don't get this quite right, our model might not all be that stable. So we might get to a certain point, we might reach a cap in terms of our maximum reward. But now another thing to note as well is that training can take a long time. So if you've got a really, really open environment, so say for example, you're trying to train a reinforcement learning model for Grand Theft Auto because it's such a huge environment, training a model to sort of work out what to do in that particular case is going to take a long, long time. All right. Now, not to be a downer, I just sort of wanted to bring up some of those limitations and considerations. Now, on that note, let's start getting onto our setup. So step number one is going to be setup. What we're first up going to do is install our required dependencies. Now, in this case, it's really, really simple to get up and running with this. It's just a single pip install. All you need to do is run exclamation mark pip install stable dash baselines three, and then inside of square brackets pass through extra. So stable baselines is a reinforcement learning library that allows you to work with model free algorithms. But again, we'll talk about that later. So we can work with stable baselines to build up a reinforcement learning agent to be able to train against a specific environment. Now, the cool thing about stable baselines is that it's actually based off an original library called baselines, which was built by OpenAI. The great thing about stable baselines is that there's a whole heap of really, really useful helpers. Now, I've got the documentation on the screen. So this is the full, this is the migration uh, link. But if you wanted to go into stable baselines, I'm going to include these links in the description below, as well as all the code that you're seeing in here. But you can see here that stable baselines actually is, or this is the documentation, there's a whole heap of guides um, and it's a really, really well supported environment or really well supported library as well. So again, really, really, really useful. Um, there's a whole bunch of getting started information if you want to be able to leverage that. 
sort of shows you how to get started really, really quickly. So this here is one single uh, reinforcement learning environment and training in a single, what is that, like 40, 20 lines of code. So again, you can get started really, really quickly with this. But we're going to be going through all of this in great detail as we're walking through it. So let's kick things off and start by installing stable baselines. So I'm going to be working inside of a Jupyter Notebook environment for this. Um, and I'm going to give you the baseline code or the starter code as well as the completed code as well inside of the GitHub repo in the description below. So you'll be able to pick up all of this and work with it at your own pace. So first things first, we're going to have 10 different steps that we're going to be going through for our main tutorial. And then we're going to have our projects as well. So the first thing that we need to do, well, let, let's actually take a look at these 10 steps. So first up, what we're going to do is import our dependencies. Then we're going to load up our environment. So in this case, we're going to be solving a reasonably simple environment called Cartpole. And I'll show you that in a sec. We're going to take a look at how to understand an environment because that is so, so important. Then we'll train a reinforcement learning model. I'll show you how to save it down to disk and reload it. So if you wanted to go and move it elsewhere or go and deploy it, you could do that. We'll take a look at how to evaluate it, how to test it, how to view our logs inside a tensor board how to add a callback to the training stage. So this allows you to stop your training at a certain point once you're happy with it, how to change policies as well as how to use an alternate algorithm. So we're going to be covering quite a fair bit, but again, take it at your own pace. And if you get stuck or if you have any questions at all, hit me up in the comments below or join the discord server. Again, link will be in the description below. Always happy to chat there as well. All right, enough on that. Let's actually kick this thing off and write some code. So the first thing that we're going to do is install our dependencies and import them. So in this case, we're going to be installing stable baselines three. So remember we had exclamation mark pip install stable dash baselines three and then in square brackets extra. So let's go on ahead and write that. Alrighty, that looks like it's all installed successfully. So you can see we don't, we've got a warning there that says to upgrade pip. That's fine. Don't worry about it but it looks like we're all good to go. Now, in this case, that is now done. So that again, really simple to get started with stable baselines. It's a single pip install, but again, there's so much you can do with it, which makes it pretty cool. So the next thing that we want to do, oh, let's actually take a look at that line. So we've written exclamation mark pip install and then stable dash, which uh, we've just gone and screwed that up, stable dash baselines and then three and then extra. Now, the reason that we're passing through three is that stable baselines has gone through a number of iterations. So there was a stable baselines one and then a stable baselines two. We're now up to stable baselines three. So this is the latest package, again, which runs on TensorFlow and PyTorch. We're gonna be using PyTorch for this, but just uh, something to keep in mind. So that's the reason that we're passing through the three. All right, now that's our installation done. We're all good to go. Now, the next thing that we want to do is actually import some stuff. So let's go on ahead and import some dependencies, and then I'll talk you through each one of those. Okay, so those are our main dependencies now imported. So we've gone and written five lines of code there. So first up, what we've written is import OS. So OS is just an operating system library. That's going to make it a little bit easier later on when we go to define our paths to save our model as well as where to log out. Then we've imported Jim. So Jim is for open AI Jim, but I'm going to talk about this a little more once we get into our environment section of our slides. So Jim allows us to build environments and work with pre-existing environments really, really easily. Then we've imported our first algorithm. So we've actually imported PPO. So to do that, we've written from stable underscore baselines three, import PPO. And again, there's a whole heap of different types of algorithms. So if we actually take a look, we're actually taking a look at the stable baselines package that should be stable baselines three. So if you actually take a look, there's a whole heap of different algorithms there. So there's A2C, DDPG, DQN, HER, PPO, SAC, and TD3. Now, again, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. So I'm actually going to talk about when to use which algorithm um, and under which circumstances. So again, don't fret if you're seeing this and you're like, oh my God, there's so much. 
we're actually going to go through this and I'll actually give you a little bit of a guide or at least some guide rails as to when to use which particular type of algorithm. But in this case, we're going to be using this one here, so PPO. So again, if you wanted to see the documentation, it's all there and you can take a look at the performance of that particular algorithm. Cool, right? Okay, so that's this line here. So from stable underscore baselines import PPO. And then the next one that we've written is from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot vec underscore env import dummy vec env. Now, I'll talk about this a little more once we get to the breakout tutorial, but basically stable baselines allows you to vectorize environments. This means that it allows you to train your machine learning model or train your reinforcement learning agent on multiple agents at the same or multiple environments at the same time. This means that you can get a huge boost in your training speed by doing that. Now, in this case, we're not going to be vectorizing our environment. So we're going to be able to use this dummy vec env wrapper instead. You'll see what it actually looks like when we do vectorize in the breakout uh, project. But again, for now, just think of this as a wrapper around your environment, makes it easier to work with stable baselines. Then the next thing that we've written is from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot evaluation import evaluate underscore policy. So evaluate underscore policy makes it easier to test out how a model is actually performing. So what you'll actually get when we run this is the average reward over a certain number of episodes. Again, I'll talk about it more later. And you'll also get the standard deviation for that particular agent that you're training. So again, five lines of code. So import OS, import gym, import our algorithm, which is PPO, import our dummy vec and V wrapper and import our evaluate policy helper, which will be used somewhere around here. Cool, that is pretty much it in terms of our dependency. So we've written five lines of code. Now on to step two, environments. So I think a key thing to call out is the difference between simulated and real environments. Now, this is why we're using OpenAI Gym. So OpenAI Gym allows you to build simulated environments really, really easily. So there's a whole heap of helpers. It's a really well-supported library, and that's particularly why it's really, really popular when it comes to working with reinforcement learning. Now, a key thing to call out is that when we're working with reinforcement learning, often one of the benefits is that by using simulated environments, we're able to reduce cost and we're able to produce better models a whole heap faster. Now, say for example, you're working for an engineering company and your engineering company wants to build an autonomous agent to go and train this robot over here to be able to move a particular ball to a certain position. Now, this robot is actually called a fetch robot. It's actually a real robot. So you can actually take a look at what it looks like. Now, they might only be able to afford a single robot. So this sort of limits how fast they may be able to train that particular robot. And obviously there's costs involved with actually training that robot. So you're going to be wearing down the joints. You're going to be using electricity. It's going to take a lot more time and cost to be able to train that robot if you're doing it in a real environment. Now, one of the amazing things about reinforcement learning is that you can try to simulate that environment to be able to train the agent in the same way. Over here, you can see that this is actually a replica of this robot and it's actually built inside of a simulation tool called Mujoko. So again, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but this makes it a whole heap easier to train and a whole heap more cost effective to be able to go ahead and train your agent, which is actually pretty cool because I mean, this technology hasn't been around for a whole heap of time, but it obviously improves the ability for people to leverage reinforcement learning. So rather than having to go and do it in real or in real time on that particular agent, they can do it in a simulated environment and run it on there. But again, ultimately what you may find is that whilst we may train on a simulated environment, the end goal is to take that agent and go and deploy it on a production like environment, which would be a real robot. Likewise, if you're doing it on a game, you might train on a testing version of the game and you might deploy on a real version of the game. So you sort of get the idea between a simulated and a real environment. This is simulated, this is going to be real. Now, this is where OpenAI Gym comes in. So OpenAI Gym gives you a really lightweight environment, but really feature packed to be able to go and build out a reinforcement learning environment. Now, in this case, you can actually take a look at the docs. So it's at https colon forward slash forward slash gym.openai.com forward slash docs. So if we actually go to that link, which is over here, we can go to docs. 
you can see that there's a whole heap of documentation around how to actually use OpenAI Gym. And the nice thing about this, and particularly why I've used this particular environment or framework, is that there's a whole heap of support. So it's really, really well supported. A lot of people are using this when it comes to OpenAI Gym. So know when you're looking at um, cutting edge stuff or you're looking at what skills to learn, if you wanted to go and do this for your career, OpenAI Gym tends to be the standard in this particular space. Now, there's a whole heap of pre-built environments that you can actually use inside of OpenAI Gym. So remember, I was talking about Mujoko for that particular robot. So you can actually, oh, it might not be Mujoko. It might be under robot, robotics. So you can see that we've actually got our fetch robot over here. There's also this shadow hand uh, robot. Now, these are actually based on real robots. So if you actually Google fetch robot, oh, that's not what I meant to type, fetch robot. You can actually see, so it's actually a real robot that I'm actually showing you here. So this robot is exactly mimicking this. This robot, this hand one is actually called a shadow hand robot. Shadow hand robot, I believe. There you go. So you can actually see, these are actually based on real robots that are out there in the real world. So people are trying to train them using OpenAI Gym. Now there's also a bunch of environments around algorithms, around Atari, which we'll do a little bit later around box 2D. So we're actually going to be testing out this one. Classic control. So we're going to be testing out Cartpole, uh, Mujoko, Robotics, Toy Text, so on and so forth. There's a whole heap. There's also a whole heap of third-party environments. So if you wanted to do something really, really hardcore, you could definitely take a look at those as well. So I remember I was talking about Kala. I believe there's one over here. So there's actually a wrapper to be able to leverage Kala as part of open AI gym. Now, in this case, we are going to be dealing with classic control to begin with. So we're going to keep this relatively simple and try to solve the cart pole environment. So if we actually take a look at this, the goal in this particular case is to get this little robot down here to be able to balance this beam. Now you can see right now, it's sort of uh, bumping around side to side and the beam is sort of falling over. Now there's two actions that we can really take. We can move it to the left or we can move the cart to the right. But again, I'll delve into this a little bit more. So what we're gonna be able to do is train a reinforcement learning agent to be able to solve that particular problem. Now, what we're gonna do next up is we're actually gonna be taking a look at what that environment actually looks like. Now, a key thing to note is that when you're actually taking a look at open AI gym environments, is that these environments are represented by something called spaces. There are a number of different types of spaces that OpenAI Gym supports. Now, the names might be a little bit tricky when it comes to actually leveraging them, but let me sort of walk you through them. So the first one is box. Now, this is a range of values. So think of, say, for example, you wanted a continuous value, you're going to want to use a box space. So the way to instantiate a box space is by using box and then passing through the low value, the high value and the shape of the space. Again, I'm gonna delve into this a whole heap more when we actually take a look at our environment. And we're actually gonna use some of these spaces to actually build up our own custom environment in project three. The next type of space is discrete. So this is just a set of items. So if I type in discrete and then pass through the value three, what you're actually gonna get back in terms of your space is the values zero, one, and two. So it's actually gonna give you discrete numbers that represent specific mappings to something. So typically you'll see discrete actions used for, or typically you'll see discrete spaces used for actions. So action zero will be something, action one will be something, and action two will be something else. Uh, you've also got tuple. So tuple allows you to combine spaces together. So you can see we can use tuple and then pass through discrete and box. So this just allows you to join them. Key thing to note is that stable baselines doesn't support tuple. So again, Good to know, but you're not going to use it all that much. Uh, you've also got dict spaces. So this is just a dictionary of spaces. So really similar to tuples, but in this case, we're just declaring dict and then we're passing through a dictionary of spaces. The other two types of spaces, these are ones that I haven't de dealt with too much, but it's important to note that they're there. So you've got a multi-binary space. So this is a one hot encoded set of binary values. So if you pass through multi-binary and pass through the value four, what you're going to get is a list of values and you're going to have four positions. So you'll have zero, one, two, three. So ideally four values. And you're just effectively going to have a binary flag. So ones or zeros represented in those positions. So it's a one hot encoded vector of different actions or different spaces. 
You've also got multi discrete. So this is very similar to our discrete space, but in this case, you can have uh, multiple sets of values. So you'll have zero, one. So if I pass through five, two, two, what I'll get back is uh, a range of values between zero and four for the first position, zero and one for the second position, and zero and one for the third position. So again, you can start to see how these spaces sort of play. But enough on that, let's actually take a look and start building our environment. So back to our notebook, what we're going to do now is start loading up our environment. So first up, what we're going to do is we're going to use OpenAI Gym to instantiate our environment, and then we'll actually test it out and take a look at it. So let's first up load our environment. Okay, that is two lines of code to be able to go and create our environment. Now I've gone and separated it out into two lines of code, but you can make it one and I'll sort of explain this. So the first line of code that we've written is environment underscore name equals cart poll dash V zero. Now this is case sensitive. So make sure you get the case correct. So we've got a capital C A R T P O L E dash V zero. So this environment name is just a mapping to the open or pre-installed open AI gym environments. Then what we're doing is we're actually making our environments. We've written EMV equals gym dot make, and then to that we've passed through our environment name variable. So again, if we actually just printed out the environment name variable, it's just gonna be a string, right? Environment name, just a string, right? Nothing crazy there. Now, what we can actually do is we can actually test out this environment. So remember, what we're going to do initially is just take random actions in that environment. But eventually what we're going to do is we're going to take our agent and specifically our reinforcement learning agent and try to get it to take the right actions in that particular environment to maximize our reward. That's what reinforcement learning is all about. So what we want to do first up is sort of get an understanding of the environment. It's really, really important to understand what's actually happening in that environment before you try to do anything, because you might be trying the wrong algorithms. You might be doing a whole bunch of random stuff, um, but understanding the environment is going to make your life so much easier. Trust me on this. So let's go on ahead and write a bit of a loop to test out our environment. So let's go do this. Alrighty, so I've written a lot of code there, but I'm going to take it step by step with you. So again, we're going to take this step by step whenever we're going through this stuff. So what is that? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 lines of code. Now, again, all of this code, including the beginner as well as the completed tutorials are going to be available in the GitHub description below. So if you want to take this and walk through it and compare your code, you can do that. First up, what we're going to do is walk through each step or each line of this code. So what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be trying to test out the cart poll environment five times. Now, what we've actually gone and done is created a variable called episodes and we've set that to five. So this means that we're going to try to loop through our environment five times to see how we can operate within it. So we've written episodes equals five and then we're looping through each one of those episodes. So for episode in range, and then we're starting off at one and then we're going episode plus one. So this is effectively just looping through each one of the episodes. If we actually wrote this out, so episodes equals five for episode in range one comma episodes plus one. Let's print out our episode. So you can see that it's just going to be looping through one to five, right? So that's all these two lines are doing here. Then what we're doing is we're resetting our environment. So by running env.reset, we're going to get our initial set of observations. Remember, there was those five key components to any environment or four key components. There was the agent, the action, the environment, and then the observations plus the rewards. So by running env.reset, we're going to get our initial set of observations. So if I type in env.reset, you can see that these are the observations for our particular environment. Now, I'll talk about what these values mean in a second once we actually get to understanding the environment. But for now, just understand that these are the observations that we get for our particular poll, right? So we're getting these four values. 
Now, what we're effectively going to be doing is passing these observations, or later on, we'll pass these observations to our reinforcement learning agent to determine what the best type of action is to be able to maximize our reward. So our agent's gonna see these values and it's gonna go, hey, I've got these values. What should I do or what action should I take to be able to maximize my reward and get that bar in the straightest possible position? Then over here, we're just setting up some temporary variables. So we're setting whether or not the episode is done. So you've got a maximum number of steps within this particular environment. And we're also setting up a running score counter across the episodes. Then we've got a while loop. So while not done, we're then going to render our environment. So the render function allows us to view the environment or view the graphical representation of that environment. Key thing to call out is if you're running this inside a collab, the render function is not going to work like this. You got to do a little bit of extra work. So hit me up in the comments below if you want a little bit of help with that. Then what we're doing is we're generating a random action. So rather than taking in our observations and actually generating an action, which is actually useful, we're just going to take a random one. So this is akin to doing this. So I can just type in, let's actually move this down. So what we'd be doing is emv.actionspace dot sample so we're just generating a random action this is actually really good to note as well so if i actually take off sample remember how i was talking about the different types of action spaces in this case here we've got discrete is two so this will mean that we get two different types of actions so we've got zero or one so if we actually type in dot sample you can see we've got one this time got one got one got zero so you can see our action space is just going to have those two different actions, zero or one. This is what discrete two, which is what our action space looks like, represents. Now we can actually take a look at our observation space as well. This is a key thing to call out. So there's going to be two different spaces within any environment. Your action space. So these are the actions you can take on that environment and your observation space. So this is what your observations actually look like for that particular environment. So it's a partial view. So if we type in observation space, you can see that we've actually got a box environment. So we've got these values here. So that's going to be our lower bound and this is going to be our upper bound. And then we've got four commas. So this means that we're going to have four values. So zero, oh, zero, one, two, oh, one, two, three, four. And then they're going to be in the D type float 32. So again, you can start to see how our environment is actually built up. Now, again, we can sample this if we wanted to. And this is going to look almost identical to what we get from enb.reset up here then what we can actually do is we can actually pass through our random action. So this is the next line that we've written to our environment. So we can do this using env.step. So if we actually did that, so env step and pass through the values one, you can see we're gonna get our observation back. So again, we can keep doing this. And this is really just us passing through our action. Now, what we actually get back from this is actually really, really interesting. So we're going to get back our next set of observations, which are what you can see there. And we're also going to get our reward. So this is whether or not we're getting a positive value or a negative value. So one is obviously increment. Zero is going to be a decrement or negative one is going to be a decrement. And then true is basically specifying whether or not our episode is done. So remember, we've got this done statement here and this done statement up here. So once our episode is done, we're going to stop it. So that full line of code is n underscore state comma reward comma done comma info. So this is just unpacking the values that we get from env dot step. And then the next line of code is just accumulating our reward So score plus equals reward. And then we're just printing out the results that we actually get from taking that step. So we've written print and then open quotes, episode, colon, squiggly brackets, score, colon, squiggly brackets. I call them squiggly brackets dot format. And then we're passing through our episode and our score. And then last but not least, we're closing our environment. So when we use env.render, you'll get this Python pop up to close it down. You just need to run env.close. Cool. So that is all well and good. Let's actually test this out. So if we run this now, should see down the bottom, that's our environment testing itself out. Now, if we didn't want to close it, we can just comment this line down here so we can actually see it. And there you sort of go. So again, it's running really, really quickly and it's just sort of moving the bar around. When we actually go to test it out, we'll see it uh, run a little bit more slowly. But you can sort of see, so if we keep running it, uh, it looks like we've screwed it up. Let's actually close it, so env.close. And then it's closed down. So let's run it again. Then we can close it. 
And you can start to see what's sort of happening there, right? Our actions are moving this black box to the left and to the right, and our bar is effectively swaying based on response to that. So ideally, the goal is to hold that bar as straight as possible for as long as possible. Cool. All right. So that is a whole bunch of stuff now done. Now we've taken a look at how we can sample our environment. So let's actually take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So remember there's two parts to our environment. There's our action space and our observation space. So if we type in env dot action space, that's going to be our actions. And then we can type in env dot observation space. And those are going to be our observations. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Nick, what are these values that we get from these observation spaces So and action spaces? So let's actually type this. So if we write dot sample and dot sample to the end of these, you can see that we've got these values. So let's actually duplicate this. So we've got both. So env dot action space and emb dot observation space. Right, so this is describing the type of action space. This is actually an example, type of observation space, and then this is an actual example. Now we can actually take a look at what these represent. So I've actually got this link here, which actually gives you a little bit more detail. So in terms of our observation, so this is actually from the OpenAI Gym documentation. So you can actually zoom into this. So in terms of our observation space, remember we've got a box for, which is this down here. So box and then four. The first position represents the cart's position and it's got a minimum value of minus 4.8 and a maximum value of 4.8. We've also got the cart velocity, which is going to be this value here. We've then got the pole angle, which is going to be this value here. And then we've got the pole angular velocity. So I'm guessing this is sort of the speed at which um, the pole is moving up or down. So again, these observation spaces just map to this. Now, not every environment is going to be well documented like this, but I sort of wanted to give you an idea. So car position, car velocity, pole angle, pole velocity. Car position, car velocity, pole angle, pole velocity. Then in terms of our action spaces, remember we've got two possible actions, zero or one. These are the descriptions for our actions. So action zero is going to push our cart to the left. Action one is going to push our cart to the right. So you can sort of see how these actions and observations sort of play together. Now that is our environment in a nutshell. So you can see that we've gone and done a few things there. So we went and defined our environment. We then went and tested it out. And then we went and actually took a look in granular detail to be able to actually understand how this environment actually fits together. Now I think this is really, really important because it gives you an idea as to what the hell you're trying to solve. But keep in mind that whenever you're solving one of these environments, you're typically going to have an action space and an observation space. And it's a good idea to try to understand what each one of those means. But on that note, that is our environment now set up. So we can actually close this. So let's go and take a look at what's next. So this brings us to step three, training. So a key thing to call out is that there are a heap of different types of algorithms when it comes to reinforcement learning. Now, typically these are grouped into model-based RL and model-free based reinforcement learning algorithms. Now, we're mainly going to be focusing on model-free based reinforcement learning algorithms because that's where a lot of development is happening. But that's not to say that model-based reinforcement learning isn't useful as well. So a core thing to note in terms of model-free RL. So the whole idea between model-free RL is that it only uses the current state values to try to make a prediction. With model-based reinforcement learning, what's actually happening is it's trying to make a prediction about the future state of the model to try to generate a best possible action. So there are a whole heap of advantages for, and again, so I'm not gonna go through it in great detail. There is a great document on this down at the OpenAI website. So under HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash spinning up dot openai.com. There's a really, really good explanation of model free versus model based RL. Now, if you, so I guess a key thing to call out is that stable baselines really only deals with model free based RL. There are a number of other libraries that look at model-based RL as well. I believe RLlib is one of them. So we're going to be focusing on model-free RL. And specifically, we're going to be taking a look at 
the A2C algorithm, PPO, and we'll also probably use, I think we'll probably only use those two to begin with. But again, oh, we'll also use DQN over here as well. So again, we'll use a few different types of algorithms so you can sort of see what they look like. But that sort of gives you an idea as to what's sort of out there. There's a bunch of algorithms broadly grouped into model-free versus model-based reinforcement learning. Now, a core thing to note is choosing the best possible algorithm for your use case. So we've talked a little bit about different types of action and observation spaces so far. Now, the algorithm that you're going to try to use or the algorithm that I'd suggest you use should ideally be one that maps appropriately to your particular type of action space. So you can see here that in terms of stable baselines, there's a whole bunch of different types of algorithms. So we've got A2C, DDPG, DQN, HER, PPO, SAC, and TD3. And I'll show you how to actually use these different algorithms a little bit later in the main tutorial. But a key thing to note is that certain algorithms can only work on certain types of action spaces. So you can see here that A2C works on boxes, discrete, multi-discrete, and multi-binary. DDPG works on box spaces only. DQN works on discrete spaces only. And this is in reference to the action space. So a key thing to call out is that it's based on the action space, not so much the observation space. So remember, if we go back to our main tutorial, so it's this over here. So if you type in emb.actionspace and you say that it's discrete, then you know, let's scroll back, then you know that you can use any one of the models down here that has a green tick under discrete. So we could use A2C to solve this, DQN, HER, and PPO. Now, if you had a box environment, so remember if we take a look at our observation space, assume our action space had a shape of box, well then you'd be looking at using one of these ones. So A2C, DDPG, HER, PPO, SAC, or TD3. I've got a little bit of a guide down here. So discrete single process, use a DQN, discrete multi-process use PPO or A2C if you're using a continuous single process SAC or TD3 continuous multi-process PPO or A2C a key thing to call out guys is that treat these algorithms as commodities so you can choose to use whichever one you want for your particular use case some are going to perform better than others it's good to know how they work it is better to know in detail how they're put together but again you don't really need to know that or that level of detail to be able to try this out or try your hand at it it's just important to know which algorithm you should use for which type of action space and again all of them are available inside of the stable baselines documentation so you can see that we've got all of those here so remember to get to this you can go to stable-baselines3.readthedocs.io forward slash en forward slash master forward slash models and then this is if you want to look at the ppo algorithm modules forward slash ppo.html but again all the links are going to be in the description below so you can grab that and pick it up Cool. So we've talked a little bit about different types of algorithms and when to use which one. Now, another thing to note is that you need to be able to understand your training metric. Now, which type of algorithm you use is going to determine what type of metrics you get during training. But broadly, you should get something that looks a little bit like this. And you'll see this once we kick off our training. So we can break this up into evaluation metrics, time metrics, loss metrics, and then we've got other metrics. So our evaluation metrics are all to do with our episode length and our episode reward mean. Well, so these are our averages. So our length is how long our episode actually went for. So if you're playing a game, think of it as one single game. When we're trying to balance our cart poll, one episode is the number of steps, the maximum number of steps we're allowed to take. Our time metrics. So in this case, we've got frames per second. So this is how fast you're processing iteration so that means how many times you've actually gone through time elapsed how long it's been running and total time steps so that's how many steps you've actually taken in an episode you've also got some loss metrics so you've got entropy loss policy loss value loss again if you want a greater detail or if you want a greater explanation on that hit me up in the comments below we've also got some other metrics as well so we've got the explained variance so this is how much of the variance in the environment your agent is able to explain You've also got your learning rate to how fast our policy is actually updating. And you've also got N updates, which is how many updates we've actually made to our agent. Now, a core thing to call out is that by default, when we actually go and install stable baselines using the pip install command, 
we're only going to be installing that without GPU acceleration. Now, if you wanted to use GPU acceleration, you could, all you need to do is just go and install the appropriate PyTorch version. So say for example, I wanted to leverage GPU acceleration on my particular machine, which I'll show you in a sec. All I would need to do is go to pytorch.org. So if we go to our baseline install page, hit install. And then if we scroll on down, you can see that down here, it sort of gives you the steps to go and install this. So I could choose the stable install. I'm working on a Windows machine, but if I could, if I was on a Mac, I could hit Mac, Linux, I could hit Linux. So I'm gonna choose Windows. And then in this case, I'd say, for example, I wanted to install using pip, I could just hit pip. And then I could choose the language that I wanted to install for. So if I wanted Java, I could choose that. If I wanted Python, in this case, we're working with Python. So I choose Python. And then I need to choose the compute platform. This is really, really important here. So core thing to call out is that CUDA and CUDNN are only supported on NVIDIA GPUs. So if you want to leverage GPU acceleration, you have to have an NVIDIA GPU to use CUDA. Now, over here, you've also got Rock M. Now, Rock M is the beta package which is available for AMD GPUs. Now, I believe this is only available on Linux at the moment. So if you wanted to use an AMD GPU to be able to do this, you'd need to be able or you'd need to be on the Linux OS. In this case, I'm on Windows, so you can see it's not available on Windows. So I'd be using CUDA or in this case, CUDA 10.2 or CUDA 11.1. Now, this is really only needed if you want to use GPU acceleration. To be honest, with reinforcement learning, you're not going to see as much of a performance boost in training as you would with traditional deep learning by using a GPU. So if you don't have a GPU, don't stress, don't worry about it. You don't need to do this step. I just wanted to call it out for people that do have a GPU that wanted to do that. But in this case, we'll probably do that in one of our other projects and take a look at how to install that. So for now, you can sort of skip this. It's just a good thing to note. Alrighty, so on that note though, let's go on ahead and let's go and train our agent. So I'm gonna skip back into our notebook and what we're going to do now is start training our reinforcement learning model. So first up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a log path and this is going to be where we save our TensorBoard log. So if we wanted to go and monitor our training, we'd be able to take a look inside of this log directory and view how our model is actually performing. So I'll show you how to do that down here. So let's go on ahead and first up define our log path. So I'm gonna type in log path or log underscore path, and then we'll specify that. Now, a key thing to call out is that this path needs to exist. So we can also create it as part of our code, but I've just gone and done it manually because it's reasonably straightforward. So what I'm going to do is inside of the folder that we're working with, I'm gonna create a folder called training and then inside of that, I'm going to create two additional folders, one called logs and one called save models. Let's zoom in on this. So you can see that we've got a training folder and then we've got one called logs, one called saved models. So inside of our logs folder, we're going to save our logs. So in this case, you can see I've got a bunch. Let's delete them because we don't need those. And inside of saved models, we've got a bunch of models as well. So I'm just going to delete these ones because we don't need those for now. So our logs is going to be where we save our logs for our model and our saved models are going to be where we save our saved model. So our trained model. So again, we'll take a look at those a little bit later once we actually go and do it. Okay, so that is that now done. So again, when you're doing this, I'm going to add a comment. So make your directories first. All right, so we're going to define our log path. So again, this is just going to give us a path to our logs, training backwards slash backwards slash logs. And because I'm on a Windows machine, the path is represented by a double backwards slash. If you're on a Mac or a Linux machine, I believe it's a forward slash. Cool. So that is our log path now defined. Now, the next thing that we need to do is instantiate our algorithm and specifically our agent. Now, remember when we went and imported our dependencies, we went and imported PPO. So in this case, PPO is going to be the algorithm that we're going to be using for this particular environment. So let's go on ahead and define that and then we'll take a look. Okay, that is our algorithm now set up. Now you can see here that it's printed out using CUDA device. This is because I do currently have GPU acceleration 
set up for this particular environment. If you were not using the PyTorch CUDA version or the PyTorch GPU accelerated version, what you would see here is using CPU device. So again, no need to stress if you're not using GPU acceleration, I'll show you how to set it up later. If it says using CPU device, that's perfectly fine as well. You're still good to go. All right, so in order to do that, we've written three lines of code here. So we've written, so we've gone and recreated our environment here. This is just to keep it all encapsulated. So I've written env equals gym dot make, and then to that we'll pass our environment name. So this line over here is no different to this line over here. So again, exact same thing. Then what we've done is we've wrapped our environment inside of that dummy vec env wrapper. So remember up here, we imported this. This is where we're actually wrapping it. So to do that, we've written env equals dummy vec env. And then we've created a Lambda function. So this is going to be an environment creation function. So inside of square brackets, I've written Lambda colon and then env. So this is going to allow us to work with our environment that's wrapped inside of that dummy vectorized environment. So again, just think of it as a wrapper for a non vectorized environment. I'll show you a real vectorized environment when we get to our project one. And then we've actually gone and defined our model. So think of this as defining our agent. So we've written model equals PPO. So again, this is the algorithm that we've gone and imported over here. And then to that, we've passed through, what is that? Uh, two arguments and two keyword arguments. So the first one is defining the policy that we're going to use. So in this case, it's a MLP policy. This stands for multi-layer perceptron policy. Now, in this case, this means that we're going to be using a neural network, which is just using standard sort of neural network units. We're not using LSTM layers and we're not using CNN layers. What we will do inside of project one and project two is we'll actually use a CNN policy. Core thing to call out as well is stable baselines two actually had one advantage over stable baselines three in that it actually had an MLP LSTM policy. So if you wanted to use windowed data sets, which are particularly useful for trading or finance, uh, as well as certain gaming applications, that particular policy isn't unfortunately available in stable baselines three, as far as I know. So again, um, if that changes, I'll mention it in the pinned comment below. For now, it supports MLP policy and I believe CNN policy. You'll see CNN policy inside of project one. The next argument that we've passed through is our environment. So this is going to be this vec dummy vectorized environment here. We've specified verbose equals one because we want it, or we want to log out the results for that particular model. And then we've specified our tensorboard log path. So tensorboard underscore log, and we've specified it as this log path here. So if we actually go and take a look at this algorithm, PPO, there are a whole heap of arguments that we can actually pass through here. So you can see that we can pass through the policy, the environment, the learning rate, the number of steps, the batch size, the number of epochs, gamma, GAE lambda. So there's a whole bunch of different types of hyperparameters that you can actually train on here as well. And a whole bunch of different things that you can actually train. So again, you've, there's a whole bunch of documentation on this particular environment. And you can see all of that there. So again, we're keeping this pretty simple and we're using the standard hyperparameters in this particular case. So now that our agent is now set up, the next thing that we need to do is just go on ahead and train it. So again, this is pretty simple from here on out. So we just need to use model.learn to be able to go and train it. So let's do it. So if we type in model.learn, and then we just need to pass through the number of time steps that we want to train it for. So again, I'm just going to pass that through. And initially, I'm just going to set that to 20,000. So the full line is model.learn. And then we're passing through a keyword argument. So total underscore time steps equals 20,000. Now you can play around with this number and in terms of how long you want to train. So for a simple environment, you're probably going to be able to get away with a lower number of total time steps. For a sophisticated environment, say for example, breakout or the self-driving environment, you're probably going to need a heap more. So for example, for cart poll, I've managed to solve it more often than not in under 20,000 steps. For the breakout and the self-driving tutorial, well, breakout doesn't actually have a end goal per se, but that actually took around about 300, 400,000 time steps as did the self-driving tutorial. So again, the complexity in the environment is going to define how many time steps you need to train for. So in this case, we're pretty happy with 20,000. So we can go on ahead and kick that off. And what you'll see eventually is once this model starts training, it looks like we've got a bit of an error there. 
Okay, it looks like it might've just been a warning. Okay, so you can see our model is now starting to train. So we're getting our time metrics and we're also getting a whole bunch of additional training metrics. So let's let this go on ahead and run. And then as soon as it's done, we'll be able to test it out. Okay, so we can see that our model has finished training. And if we take a look, so it looks like we've got an explained variance of 0.231. We've got an entropy loss of minus 0.599, a learning rate of 0 0.0003, loss of 57.6. Looks like it wasn't all that stable to the end, but that's fine. Let's test it out and see what this actually looks like. So that's our model now trained, or at least trained for 20,000 steps. Now, if we wanted to, we could go and train this for longer. So all we need to do is go and run it again. It's going to start training again. So you can see it's kicking off training and it's going on. So again, you, if you wanted to train it for longer, all you need to do is go and run that again. Now, now that we've kicked it off, let's let that finish and then we'll actually test it out. Okay, so that is our next round of training now done. It looks like our explained variance is a little bit higher. Learning rate still the same. We've gone through a total of 20,480 time steps. So again, this is just for this latest run. Now, more often than not, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to save down this model and move it around. If you wanted to go and deploy it, you'd want to be able to save it. So let's take a look at how we might save and reload our model first up, and then we'll go and evaluate it. So we're going to define a path and we're just going to call it a PPO path, similar to what we did for our log path. Cool. So that's our path defined. So I've just written PPO underscore path. So that's going to be our path variable equals OS dot path dot join. And then we're going to be saving it inside of our effectively our saved models folder. So training, and then saved models. And then our file name is actually going to be PPO underscore model underscore cart pole. So this is going to save our model inside of this folder. So reinforcement learning course, or well, this is my current folder training and then saved models. So it's going to be saved into here. So if we go and save it now, so you can see that our model is now saved there. So PPO underscore model underscore cart pole. So again, to save it, all I've written is model dot save, and then I've passed through this PPO path. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually go and delete this model and reload it. So let's go on ahead and do that because this sort of simulates deployment, right? You're going to be reloading from your saved model each time. So let's do it. So I'll just write DEL model to delete our model. And then what we can do is we can reload this model back into memory. So if I type in model, so we're just going to define a variable called model, and then we can actually reload it. So to do that, we're just writing PPO.load. And then we just pass through our path or the path to your actual model. So if you save it somewhere else, you're going to make sure or make sure that you pass through the full path to the model. And then we're going to pass through our environment as well. So the full line is model equals ppo.load. And then to that, we pass through the path where our model is actually saved. So remember ppo underscore path is just going to be where our model is. So in this case, it's in training, saved models, ppo model cart pole. It's exactly this. So training, saved models, ppo underscore model underscore cart pole. So that's the same file that we're working with. So let's load it. So uh, right now, so before I run this cell, so you can see if I type in model uh, dot learn, for example, total time steps equals a thousand. So this would be our training step. So you can see that we've got name model is not defined because remember we deleted our model over here. Now, if we actually went and loaded it, you can see that we've now loaded our model. And if we go and run this, you can see that we're now training again. Right, so you sort of get the idea. So you can go and train your model, you can save it using model.save, and then you can reload it using ppo.load. So remember model.save, and then you actually use the algorithm.load to be able to load it back up. Cool, that is our training now done. So in a nutshell, we've done quite a fair bit there. So we've written our, uh, so we've actually created our algorithm or our agent, so ppo, and then we'll pass through our parameters. We've used model.learn to trade our model then use model.save to save our model and then PPO or whatever algorithm you're using dot load to be able to go and reload it into memory. So again, those four key components are really, really important. 
So you use the algorithm to find the hyperparameters, model.learn to train it, model.save to save it, and then whatever the algorithm is, .load to reload it. On to step four, testing and evaluation. So, so far what we've gone and done is we've set up our environment, we've gone and trained it, but we haven't actually done anything with our trained model as of yet. Well, what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're actually going to want to train our model to see how it's actually performing. Now, you would have noticed that when we actually went and trained that model using the PPO algorithm, so let's actually go back and take a look, we didn't actually get those training metrics. Now, the training metrics that I was sort of showing up here, or the rollout metrics that you can see there, are very much dependent on the algorithm that you're using. So with the A2C algorithm, I believe you get these rollout metrics, but with PPO, you don't. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to evaluate the model itself to see what the performance is actually like. Now, we can actually use the evaluate policy method that we imported right up at the start to be able to see what that actually looks like. But a key thing to call out is if you do get these metrics, it's a great thing. So the two key ones that you need to pay attention to are the episode mean length or episode or EP underscore len underscore mean. So this is how long each episode actually lasted on average. So say for example, you're playing breakout, it's how many uh, times your model was able to play or hit the ball or how many frames it was able to go through before the model eventually died. So with gaming, this is particularly important. The reward mean is effectively the your average rewards. So remember, think back to our dog environment. So it's how many times or it's on average, how many times your dog got a treat or your average reward in this particular case. Now we can actually get metrics similar to these by using that evaluate policy method. And we can also monitor those training metrics inside of TensorBoard. So remember when we actually set up our model, we actually passed through TensorBoard underscore log and we specified our log path. So if we go back to that, so you can see over here when we defined PPO, we actually specified this TensorBoard log path. So we can then go and actually take a look at those metrics. And those are going to be our training metrics. Cool. So let's go on ahead and do that. And this is how you start TensorBoard. But again, I'm going to show you how to do this in a second. So let's do it. So we are now up to evaluation. So let's go on ahead and do this. So we're going to be using the doo -doo -doo, evaluate underscore policy method from up here. So remember, this is going to be our method that allows us to test how well our model is actually performing. Now, the PPO model in this particular case is considered solved if you get on average a score of 200 and higher. So ideally, we want to see that our model is scoring 200 on average to determine whether or not the environment is actually being solved. Now, certain environments are going to sort of have a cap as to where it's considered solved. Others are just going to be continuous. Whatever highest score you get is the best. So breakout and the self-driving tutorial, I don't believe have caps, but in this case, the carpool environment does. So let's go on ahead and test this out. Okay, so we've gone and written our line to go and test out our policy or evaluate it. And the line that we've written is evaluate underscore policy. And then to that, we've gone and passed through two arguments and two keyword arguments. So we've gone and passed through our model, our environment, how many episodes we want to test it for. So in this case, we've passed through n underscore eval underscore episodes equals 10. And then we've gone and specified render equals true. So passing through render equals true determines whether or not we actually visualize it in real time. So if you're evaluating this policy on Colab, then you want to specify render equals false because you don't want to visualize it. because It's not going to work, at least with the default evaluation. So let's go on ahead and test this out and see what our model actually looks like. So you can see it's way more stable this time. So remember when testing it out at the part, at the start, it was sort of falling down and going sort of all over the place. Now it's perfectly stable, right? So you can see that it's balancing it almost exactly. And so it's going to do this 10 times. So it's going to go through 10 different episodes and take the average reward. And we'll actually see that in a second. Pretty cool, right? So in just a couple of lines of code, you've been able to build a reinforcement learning agent. Now, again, the training speed is going to be pretty much very similar when you're training on a GPU or not on a GPU. It's going to be very, very similar. So don't fret if you don't have a GPU on your machine. Test this out regardless. Cool. So that's now done. And you can see on average, our reward is 200. So this environment is now considered solved. So we're good. 
So these two values that you get out of Evaluate Policy are the average reward over the number of episodes and the standard deviation in that reward. So in this case, we're getting a average score of 200 with a standard deviation of zero. So we're perfect. We're absolutely bang on in this particular case. Now, the next thing that we want to do is actually close down that environment. So again, we have it over here. So if we wanted to close it, we can just type in env.close and that is going to close it down. Now, right now we've gone and evaluated it, but if we actually wanted to go and deploy this, how would we actually go about doing it? So this is sort of just testing out our model in an encapsulated function. But what would happen if we actually wanted to go and rather than doing it like this, we actually wanted to do it sort of similar to what we did up here. Well, we can actually do that. The core difference is that rather than using env.actionspace.sample, we're actually going to pass through our environment observations to our agent now to try to predict the best type of action, because that's what reinforcement learning is all about. Remember, we're going to take our observations, pass it to our agent. Our agent's going to try to determine the best type of action to take to our environment to maximize our reward. So the flow is going to be very much similar. So we'll take a look at our environment. So we'll use env.reset to reset our environment and get our observations. We're then going to use model.predict on those observations to try to get the best possible type of action. And then we're actually going to take that step. So we can actually copy this entire block of code here. And right down here, let's go on ahead and test out our model. Now to this, we're going to make a few key changes. So rather than using env.actionspace.sample, we're going to change this to model dot predict and then to our model dot predict function we need to pass through our observations now right now we've got our observations named two different things so we want to change this so env dot reset we're going to change that variable to be equal to obs and then down here in env dot step dot action rather than having n underscore state we're going to change this to obs as well so ideally what we're going to change is this line over here so before it was state equals env dot reset we're going to change our action line. So rather than having env.actionspace.sample, we're going to change it to model.predict. And to that, we're going to pass through our observations. And then in our env.step line, which is where our action is taken, we're going to change that first parameter to OBS as well. So now if we run this, rather than taking random steps, we're actually going to be using our model to take steps. So remember, we've now subbed out our model. So we're now, now using model here. So if we go and run this, it looks like we've got a bit of an error. Let's take a look and we might need to, oh, we're actually going to get two parts from our model. So if we actually, uh, let's actually take a look at this. So if we use model.predict OBS, we actually get back two values. So we get this array and we get this none value. So our action is actually the first bit and the second component are our states we actually don't need that second component. So we just make that underscore. So if we actually do that now and we take a look at our action, that's looking better. All right, cool. So we're just going to make this one change. So we're going to unpack this value. And our environment is still open. So let's go on ahead and close it. It's closed. All right, let's try this again. And there you go. So you can see it's performing way better than before. It's now balancing that that poll way better than what we had initially when we were just taking random steps. And you can see the score being printed down below. So we're getting 200 pretty much every single time, which means we're smack bang on solving that model. And there you go. So you can see that we've now gone and done that. And again, we can close this. Now, if you wanted to run this continuously, you could as well, but in this case, we're doing it in a nice sort of loop. And, then, and again, we can go and do this again. So let's try running it. Pretty cool, right? So we're now actively using our reinforcement learning agent to be able to go and interact with our open AI gym environment. So it's now balancing the poll a whole heap better. Now let's actually take a look at what we did there. So we went and let's actually delete this. So if you cast your mind right back up to section two, where we're loading our environment and we're playing around with how we can actually play with it. Now, what we actually did is we had one really important function, which was env.reset. Now, remember when we type in env.reset, we're gonna get the observations for our observation space. What we can actually do is we can take these observations, so, or what we're actually doing is we're taking these observations here, 
and we're passing them to our model. So model.predict OBS. Now, what you're actually getting back here is two values. So let's actually take a look at what we're getting back. Do, do, do. So we are going to get back the model action and the next state. So that's using a recurrent policy. So again, because we're not using a recurrent policy, we're not getting that next state. So what we actually get back in this particular case that is relevant to us is this first value here, which is our array. Now, remember, in terms of our action space, space, remember, there were two different types of actions. So zero, let's see if we get one, <laughs> zero and one. Now, what we're basically getting here is rather than just getting a random action, we're using our model.predict function on our observations from our environment to generate this action here. So you can see that rather than getting emb.actionspace.sample, our model is actually predicting that based on the observations of our current environment right now, you should take action one in order to get the best possible reward. So this is effectively what reinforcement learning is all about. So if you cast your mind back to that diagram, so we've got our agent, we've got our environment, we've got our action, and we've got our reward. Let's actually go back to that slide. All right, so we've got our agent. So in this case, our agent is this model. We've got our action. Oh, that's actually, so we've got our agent, we've got our environment. So remember our environment is EMV, this variable here. We've got our action in this particular case, which is what we're just generating here. So this one, and we've also got our observations, which is this value here. So remember our observations, so we can print that out, is these four values. Now, if you cast your mind back, we actually took a look at what each one of these observations meant over here. So our observations are our cart position, our cart velocity, our pole angle, and our pole angular velocity. So again, you can start to see how this is all sort of fitting together. You've got those four key components. You've got your, you've got your agent, you've got your environment, you've got your action, and you've also got your observations. Now, a core thing that I haven't called out yet is the reward, right? So we saw that we got our model.predict. Now, how do we actually determine what our reward is? Well, we get our reward when we run env.step. So if we actually do that now, env.step, and remember our model just predicted take this action. So if we go and take that, extract that out. And if we pass our action to this, what we're actually getting back is those values that are relevant to us. So we're gonna get our state. So this is the state after taking our action on it then this value over here is actually our reward. So you can see our reward in this particular case is a value of one. Now let's actually take a look. Does it talk about reward? Uh, reward, there you go. So reward is one for every step taken, including the termination steps. So this basically means that we haven't let our poll fall down completely, which means that we get a reward of one. If you pass a certain threshold and your poll starts to fall down, then you don't get that reward. So by basically keeping our pole in the upright position and not falling down, we're getting accumulating a value of one every single time, which is how we've got this value of 200 here. So that in a nutshell sort of shows you the theory all the way through to the practical. So these five steps are getting, or what is, what are we up to? Step six, these six steps sort of show you how to define an environment, how to train a model, how to evaluate it, as well as how to test it out as well. So we've done quite a fair bit there. Now, while you're training, so this obviously trained really, really quickly, right? So we're able to spin it up, train it really quickly and get it up and running. Now, if you were training a, a way larger or more, way more sophisticated environment, what you might want to do is view the training logs inside of TensorBoard. So what we can actually do is do exactly that. Now, I'm going to start it up from within Jupyter Notebooks, but ideally you would want to run this from a command prompt so that you're not locking up your notebook because once you run this, it's going to run continuously. It's not going to unlock your notebook. You're not going to be able to run anything else. So I'll sort of show you how to do this and then we'll continue on with it. So what we first need to do is we need to get the log directory that we want to view. So if we go back to our folders, so if I go into, <clears throat> so this is our root folder. So if I go into training logs, you can see that we've got three different training sets. Now, remember we kicked off our training three times. So this is why we've got three different sets of logs. So our PPO one was our, I believe, were they all the same? No, our second one, our first and our second one were the longest. Our third one was only that 1000 training step. So let's actually take a look at PPO two. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go into that folder and we're going to specify TensorBoard to run from that folder. So first up, what we need to do is give it a path to that PPO2 folder. So let's specify that first up. Okay, so we've gone and specified our training log path. So if we go and take a look at that. So you can see this is giving us our path to our PPO2 folder. So training, logs, and then PPO2. So this is effectively, where are we going? So training, and then logs, and then PPO2. So this file over here is our TensorBoard log file that we're going to be able to use. Now, all we need to do to kick off TensorBoard from within that folder, and you're going to need TensorBoard installed. So I believe it's just a pip install TensorBoard to go and do that. To go and run this, we just need to run exclamation mark TensorBoard dash dash log dear, and then we need to specify our training log path. So yeah, that looks about right. So we've written exclamation mark TensorBoard dash dash log dear equals, and then inside of squiggly brackets, training underscore log path. Uh, we've written that wrong. So let me quickly explain what this line is doing. So I think I've had some comments on this before. So using an exclamation mark inside of a Jupyter notebook is known as using a magic command. So this allows you to run command line commands from within your notebook. So by me putting through exclamation mark, this is akin to me going to a command prompt or to a terminal and writing tensorboard dash dash log dear blah, 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 whatever. So in this particular case, what I've actually written is exclamation mark tensorboard dash dash log. Let me actually show you. It's probably going to make more sense. So if I went to D drive, CD YouTube, CD reinforcement learning. Uh, so let's actually go into, do, do, do. let's actually specify the exact same thing. So we've written training log pass. So it's going to go into training logs. Okay. So this is akin to me doing this. So tensorboard dash dash log dear equals training slash logs slash PPO2. So right, you can sort of see how this is actually running inside of a command prompt and eventually you should get a line that says it's running at HTTP localhost 6006. This line over here that I've written inside of a command prompt is exactly the same as what we would be running over here. So what I can do is I can go to this link over here, which is being created by TensorBoard. And you'll get all of your training and it doesn't look like we've got any training metrics. What's happened there? Okay, let's just go directly into the folder. So we'll go into training. Then we're going to go into PPO2. And then we'll run TensorBoard. Dash dash log dear equals dot. Third time's a charm. Let's see if this works. Okay, so it should be running at HTTP dash or colon dash dash localhost and then six and then six thousand and six. Let's refresh now. Okay, way better. So what we went and did is I went and just seeded into the folder. I'm guessing I'm getting this path that I was specifying incorrect, but that's fine. You can sort of see how to run it there. All right, so from here, you are going to get a whole heap of different metrics. Now, specifically, you're going to get train metrics. So this sort of shows you the frames per second. And you're also going to get a number of train metrics. So you're going to get clip fraction, approx underscore k. And if you want to deeper dive into what these metrics mean, how to evaluate them, by all means, do hit me up in the comments below. I'll probably have a little blue box somewhere in the corner up here that sort of explains them as well. Um, but you can start to see that you're getting all of your different training metrics. So you're getting your entropy loss, your explained variance, which should go higher, your learning rate, which looks like it stayed pretty stable, um, your loss, which looks like it's going down, your policy gradient loss, as well as your value loss. So again, you're getting a whole bunch of different types of training metrics that you can view in TensorBoard. Now, this is obviously run from the command prompt, which we had to do a little bit of rejigging to get to work. Now, rather than doing that, you can just run it from the notebook as well. So if I stop this now, all right, and close down this command prompt, what we can actually do is run this command and it'll effectively do the same for us. All right, so this is currently running. You can see the little asterisk there over here. 
Now, if I go to localhost 6006, that gives us TensorBoard all up and running now. So you can start to see how to view those logs as well. Now, in this particular case, that is our set of metrics now done. Uh, if anyone has any feedback on any of this or has um, a better way to launch TensorBoard, by all means, do hit me up in the comments below. I'm always welcome to feedback. But that sort of brings us to the end of our testing and evaluation step. So what we went and did is we went and evaluated our model using evaluate underscore policy. We went and tested it out and we also went and viewed our login tense board. So it looks like it still runs even though you end the cell. So that's something I might need to dig into. If you do have any problems with that, do hit me up in the comments below though. Now, a quick word on performance tuning and performance in general. When you are training your model, the core metric that you should be looking at is your average reward. So this gives you an indication as to how well your model is going to perform in that particular environment using that particular reward function. Now, the other metric that you wanna be taking a look at is your average episode length. So this ideally aims to identify how long your agent is actually lasting in that particular environment. Now, this is particularly important when you have environments that don't have a fixed environment length. So when we take a look at the breakout environment and when we take a look at the self-driving environment, those are really, really good indicators to be taking a look at. Now, what you can actually do is if your model is not performing that well, there's three key strategies that I'd suggest you start taking a look at. So these strategies are one, train for longer. So if you've only trained for say, for example, 10,000, 20,000 or 100,000 steps, try training your model for longer and see if that improves performance. The other thing that you can also take a look at is hyperparameter tuning. So again, when you're dealing with deep learning models or even traditional statistical machine learning models, hyperparameter tuning can yield significant results. Now, Stable Baselines supports hyperparameter tuning using a package called Optuner. So we're not gonna show it in this course, but if you'd like to see a little bit more on that, do let me know. The last thing that I'd suggest you take a look at is take a look at the different algorithms that people are using to perform state-of-the-art training as well. So this can be another thing that helps you out when it comes to improving your performance. Okay, on to our next topic. So what we're going to do, oh, we skipped all the way through. So let's go back to where were we? We are now up to step five. So callbacks, alternate algorithms, and architectures. So what we're going to be doing in this particular step is we're going to be recreating our model, but this time what we're going to do is we're going to specify a reward threshold. So this means that our training is going to stop once it hits a certain benchmark. Now, this is really, really useful when you've got really, really large models that you're trying to train and you want to stop them before your model starts getting unstable. Now, what we can actually do is we can use some of the helpers from stable baselines to do this. So we can use the eval callback and the stop training on reward threshold callback to do that. Now, the nice thing about this is that you can actually save your model as part of this as well. So it will automatically save your best model. We're also gonna take a look at how we can define a different neural network architecture. So remember we specified the MLP policy, but we can actually pass through a different neural network architecture as well. And then last but not least, we're gonna take a look at how we can use a different algorithm. So that's the last thing that we should be doing in that particular section. So let's kick this off and do it. So the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at is how we can add a callback to our training stage. Now, the cool thing about this is that if you need to stop your training after a certain reward threshold, this gives you the automated capability to do that. Now, this is really, really important, particularly when you're training huge models or models that are gonna take a long time to train. So say, for example, you're training uh, the breakout tutorial, the self-driving tutorial, you might wanna use this. Um, but again, not mandatory, it just gives you the ability to extend out your training step. So in order to do this, we first up need to install a couple of additional dependencies, namely some helpers from stable baselines. So let's go on ahead and import these. Okay, so we've gone and written one additional line of code there. So the line that I've written is from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot callbacks, import eval callback, comma, and then stop training on reward threshold. So our eval callback is going to be the callback that runs during our training stage and our stop training on reward threshold is going to be, think of it like a checker. So basically once our model passes a certain reward threshold, so remember our reward for our carpool environment was our, or the reward 
which indicates it's solved for the car pole environment is 200. So we'd basically be stopping our training once it receives or once it achieves that 200 score on average. So that's now set up. Now what we'd need to do is actually set up these callbacks. So let's go on ahead and set them up and then we'll kick off another training run using it. Okay, so those are our two callbacks sort of set up. So there's one additional thing that we need to do and we need to specify uh, where our best model is going to be. But I'll come back to that in a second. Let's actually take a look at what we wrote. So first up, what we're doing is we're setting up our stop training on reward threshold callback. This is the callback that's basically going to stop our training once we pass a certain reward threshold. So in order to do that, we've written stop underscore callback equals stop training on reward threshold, which is this that we imported up here. And then we're passing through our reward threshold. So this basically specifies after which average reward we want to stop our training on. So in this case, I've set it to 200. And then I've also specified verbose equals one. So we get some additional logging. Then the next callback that I've actually written is the eval callback. So this is the callback that's going to be triggered after each training run. Now, in this particular case, I've written eval underscore callback equals eval callback and then to that we've passed through a number of arguments so first up we're passing through our environment then we're passing through the callback that we want to run on the new best model so in this case i've written callback on new best and then we've specified stop callback so this basically means that every time there's a new best model it's going to run that stop callback and if the stop callback realizes the the reward threshold is above 200 then it's going to stop training overall now we can also specify how frequently we wanna run our evaluation callback. And in this case, I've set it to 10,000 time steps. And then I've also specified the best underscore model. We actually need to do this. So what we can actually do is have this eval callback save the model every time there's a new best model. What we do need to do, however, is specify what we want that model to be called. So let's specify that. So in this case, all I've gone and defined is the save path. So this is where we want to save that best model. So I've written save underscore path equals os.path.join. And then I've just specified the same saved model folder. So training and then comma saved space models. And then what we're going to do is we're going to specify our best model as our save path. So this means that after every 10,000 runs, it's going to double check whether or not it's passed the 200 reward threshold. If it has, it'll stop the training and it'll also save out the best model to this save pass. So, so you'll actually see this when we actually trigger it. So if we run this cell now, it looks like we've written this. This should be best model save path. My bad. There we go. Cool. So uh, we just needed to update that parameter there. So it should be best underscore model underscore save underscore path. And then we've specified our save path. That's all good to go now. So those are our two training callbacks. Now, what we now need to do is associate this to our model. So we're going to create a new PPO model and assign these callbacks. So that's our new model created. Again, this line is exactly the same as what we did when creating our initial model under step three. So again, exactly the same as this line. What's different now is that when we run our training command, so model.learn, we're going to pass through our callback. So let's do that. Okay, so what we've then gone and written is model.learn and then rather than just passing through the total time steps, we're also passing through the callback that we want to run. And in this case, we're passing through our eval callback. So this is going to be the callback that checks every 10,000 steps. And again, on every 10,000 steps, it's going to save the best new model, if it's got it, into that save path. And it's also going to check whether or not it's past that average reward threshold. So if we go on and kick this off now, we should see our training kick off. So let's do that. And so after 10,000 steps, you should see the fact that it's evaluating whether or not it's past our reward threshold. So you can see it's about 8,000 right now. So it should check on the next one. So you can see that. So it's gone and evaluated it. It's checked the episode length. So it looks on average, it's 198.8. So if we keep on going, after another 10,000, we'll see that eval callback run again. 
and there you go. So because it's now hit the 200, it stopped our training. And again, we only had 20,000, but if we train for longer, it'd stop it regardless because it's now hit that 200 score threshold. It's going to stop the training. Pretty cool, right? So this gives you a lot of flexibility when you're actually going out and training really large models and you want to cap it off before it just sort of runs wild. Now, another thing to note is that this will have also have saved our model. So if we go into reinforcement learning, go into our training folder and our saved models folder, you can see this best model folder or this best model is now saved as well. So this is a as a result of actually having our callback saved. It actually goes about and saves the best model as well. Okay, so that is our callback. Now, the next thing that we can do is also change our policy. So say, for example, we wanted to use a different neural network, what we can do is do that as well. So let's take a look at how you might do that. So in order to change our policies, we can actually specify a new neural network architecture. Now, in order to do this, we need to specify a network architecture for our custom actor as well as our value function. So I'll show you how to do this. So this is akin to just changing the number of units and the number of layers inside of your neural network. So again, pretty simple to do, and then we can pass it on to our model. So let's do it. Okay, so that is our new neural network architecture defined. Now what we need to do is actually associate it to our algorithm. So what I've actually written here is new underscore A-R-C-H, so new arch equals, and then inside of square brackets, I've defined a dictionary. Now the first neural network architecture that I've defined is for our custom actor. So in order to do that, we need to pass through pi, and then we're specifying that we're going to have a new neural network with 128 units in each one of those layers. So four layers, 128 units. So 128, 128, 128, and 128. And then we need to specify the same for our value functions. So again, four layers with 128 units in each neural network layer. So you can see that there. So VF equals, and then inside of square brackets, 128, 128, 128, and 128. Now, you get, again, you might only do this if you had a really specific reason. What I've actually found is the neural networks inside of the baseline algorithms work pretty well. But again, this sort of shows you how you might go about doing that. So let's go on ahead and associate this to our model and then kick off our training again. Oh, this should actually be net arch, my bad. There you go. Alrighty, cool. So that is our new neural network now associated to our PPO model. And specifically, we've gone and updated the policy. So what I've gone and written is model equals PPO and then MLP policy, because again, we're using the multi-layer perceptron policy. Then I've passed through our environment, verbose equals one, tensorboard log log path. So again, no, no real change from here onwards. But then in order to specify the new neural network and specifically the new policy, I've written policy underscored KW args equals, and then I've passed through a dictionary. And then to that dictionary, we've specified the net underscore arch value. And then we've set that equal to this over here. So net arch. So again, this is just defining a new neural network or a new neural network policy attached to our model. Now, what we can do is again, type in model.learn. And again, we can apply our eval callback to this as well. So again, if we go and run that, this is now using our new neural network architecture and specifically our new policy. Another thing to call out is that inside of stable baselines, you've actually got a few different policies. So if you go to the documentation and go to custom policy network, there's a whole heap of information on how to actually do this as well. So you can define custom feature extractors, so on and so forth. So again, pretty, pretty cool what you can actually do with this. And it can actually get really, really sophisticated. Now, in this case, we've got our model. Looks like it's all training sufficiently. And again, our eval callback has kicked in. So it looks like our episode length has hit 200. Looks like we're all good there. And we've stopped. Alrighty. Now, the next thing that we want to now do is actually take a look at how we might go about using an alternate algorithm. So rather than using our PPO model, which we've been using so far, we might want to use a DQN, for example. So how might we go about doing that? Well, first up, we need to import the DQN algorithm. So let's do that. Okay, so that's our DQN now imported. So I've written from stable underscore baselines, import DQN. 
And then what we can do is just go and use this in a really similar manner to how we used our PPO model. So we can actually copy this over, paste it down here. And all we really need to do is sub out PPO for DQN. And we're going to get rid of our policy keyword arguments. And so this has instantiated our DQN model. And again, model.learn. And we'll pass through total time steps. Set it to 20,000. And there you go. So this is now training a DQN model rather than a PPO model. So really, really quickly, that shows how to apply a different algorithm. But remember also in stable baselines, you've got a bunch of different types of algorithms. So you've got A2C, DDPG, DQN, HER, PPO, SAC, and TD3. In stable baselines too, there's even more algorithms in that as well. But because that is now in maintenance mode, I figured I'd show stable baselines three. Cool, so that is our DQN model now done. Now again, to save and export these, it's a very similar manner. So we just type in model.save. The only difference when you're loading from a DQN is that rather than typing in ppo.load, you'd now type in dqn.load. So that in a nutshell really covers how to add a callback to our training stage, how to change our policy, as well as how to use an alternate algorithm. Now on that note, that brings us to our projects. So step six, we're now gonna go through our different projects. So we've got three specific projects that we're gonna take a look at. So project one, we're gonna take a look at reinforcement learning for Atari games. And we're specifically going to be trying to solve the breakout problem. Then project two, we're going to try to leverage reinforcement learning to build a racing car. And this is sort of like almost going down the path of autonomous driving. And then project three, we're going to take a look at how we can build our own custom environments using the open AI gym spaces that we talked about a little bit earlier on. So first things first, let's take a look at reinforcement learning for Atari games. Okay, so inside of the GitHub repository, you're also going to have a couple of additional projects. So you're going to have project one, project two, and project three. So project one is going to be breakout. So if I actually go to the GitHub repo, so you can see you're going to have project one, which is breakout, project two, which is self-driving, and project three, which is custom environment. Now, in this case, what I've gone and done is I've started off with project one, which is breakout. Now, again, even though we're working on different environments, how we actually go about training them is going to be very, very similar. So whilst we spent a lot of time going through the basics in the main course, how we actually go about applying this to our different environments is going to be pretty much the same. So let's start off by importing our dependencies first up. Okay, so I've gone and written six different lines of code there. So these are all going to be pretty familiar to you from the previous tutorial. So the first one that I've written or the first line that I've written is importing Jim. Again, no difference there. Then from stable baselines three, I'm importing A2C. This is just a different algorithm. So again, remember how we import a PPO and then we import a DQN. Now this time we're going to be importing A2C, just a different algorithm. Then we're importing from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot vec underscore emv import vec frame stack. So remember how in the main tutorial we didn't vectorize our environment. So we only trained on one environment at a time. What we're going to do for breakout is we're actually going to train on four environments at the same time. So this should allow us to speed up our training. Then what I've written is from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot evaluation import evaluate underscore policy no change there again so we use that previously and then from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot env underscore util import make underscore atari underscore env so this line is a little bit different and just helps us work with atari environments so atari environments are the environments that allow us to play atari games so if we actually go to the gym documentation and take a look at our environments you can see under atari you've got the ability to try out a lot of these games. Now, we're specifically going to be training on Breakout. So let's take a look at that one. So it's going to look like this. Uh, it's actually this one. 
So basically the goal is just to maximize the score that you can see up here and you've got a maximum number of lives as well. Actually, this is your number of lives. This is your number of scores. So again, the goal is to just maximize that score. So there's no real cap that you can get to to completely solve the environment. It's just about getting the highest possible score. So let's go on ahead. So what else did we write there? And then import OS. So again, this is going to allow us to work with our operating system. Now, another thing that I wanted to call out. So say, for example, we wanted to use GPU acceleration. So I said I'd show how to do that. Well, all we need to do is go back to our PyTorch link. And in this case, I'm going to choose the build that I want. So stable, Windows, pip, Python. And then I've already got CUDA 11 installed on this machine. So if you don't, you're going to need to do that in order for this to work. So what I'll do is I'll just copy this link and then bring it into my notebook. So I'll add in an exclamation mark, paste that in, and I just need to get rid of this three here. So if I run that, this is now going to install the CUDA accelerated version of PyTorch. So then what typically what you need to do is just restart your kernel. So just hit kernel and then restart, hit restart, and you should be good to go. And then what we need to do because we restarted our kernel is just re-import those dependencies. So once that's done, we should be okay. Now, as of late, there has been a change to the entire environment. So previously, you used to just be able to import them and they used to sort of just work. But now you've got to do something a slight bit different. So what you actually need to do is download the RAR files from, let me just grab this link. You need to download the RAR files from this particular link here. So it's atarimania.com forward slash roms forward slash roms dot raw. So you can see that that's now downloading and I'll paste that in, I'll make that available in the notebook as well. So it'll be this. So you can see HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.atarimania.com forward slash roms forward slash roms dot raw. Without the one, you don't need that. So that's gonna download all of the files that you need to be able to work with the Atari environment. So you don't need to do that, or you didn't need to do this previously, but I think as of late, this is a change to the Atari environments that you need to do in order to use them. So once that's downloaded, you'll have a file called roms.ra. So let's wait for that to download and then I'll show you what to do with it. Okay, it looks like that has finished downloading. Let's go and take a look at it. So you can see that we've got roms.ra. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it into the same directory that I'm currently working with. So you can see I've already got roms and I've got hc rom. So these files, so I can actually delete these. And what you need to do is just paste in that roms.ra file and then unzip it. So I'm just gonna extract it. And you can see I've now got hc roms and rom, let me zoom in on this. So I've now got HC ROMs and ROMs. So what we'll then do is extract these into the same folder. And so that's HC ROMs. Let's do ROMs as well. And so once those have extracted, there's just a command that you need to run in order to install these. So it's pretty straightforward, but once that's done, you should be able to leverage the Atari environment. So let's let that finish and then we should be good to go. And if you get a warning, you can just skip those Cool, that's good. So you should now, so we can actually delete these now. So we can delete HC ROMs, ROMs.ra and ROMs. So we don't need those. We just need the extracted folders, which you can see there. Okay, so that's all well and good. Now we need to go in ahead and install those. So if we go back, we just need to run a simple command to go and install those into our environment. So let's go on ahead and do that. And there you go. So we're all good. So the command to run it is exclamation mark Python dash M and then Atari underscore Pi dot import underscore ROMs. And then you just need to pass through the path to those ROMs. So again, if I actually show you, so those files are inside of a folder called ROMs and then ROMs again. So you need to point to this particular file path here. So in this case, what I've written is exclamation mark Python dash M Atari underscore pi dot import underscore roms dot backward slash roms backward slash rom. So again, if you're on a Mac, the file path might be a little bit different. I believe it's forward slash rather than backward slash, but you sort of get the idea. So once that's done, you should be all good to go on ahead and test this environment. So let's go on ahead, set up our environment and we'll actually take a look at it.
Okay, so that's our environment now made. Now, if we type in env.reset, we should get our observation. Oh, my bad. So there you go. So we've got our observations. And if we type in, uh, what's the other one? So env.action space. I'll leave that. env.action underscore space. So you can see our action space is discrete and we've got four different actions that we can take. We can take a look at our observation space, env.observation space. You can see that our observation space is going to be a box with the values ranging from zero to 255. And the dimensions are gonna be 210 in terms of height, 160 in terms of width and three. So this means it looks like it's gonna be an image, which in this case, it's an image-based model. Now, what we can do is we can actually go on ahead and test out this model. So remember, if we cast our minds back to step six, where we actually tested out our model, we can actually copy this block of code and run the same thing here. So remember, this is just going to go on ahead and test out our particular model. Actually, this is the wrong code. Let's actually write it from scratch. So what we can do is go through a number of episodes and actually play breakout. So let's give this a crack. Okay, so let's take a look at what we wrote. So this code is really, really similar to what we used in step two, where we loaded and tested out our environment. So again, we're setting up the number of episodes that we wanna play. We're looping through each one of those episodes, and then we're basically going on ahead and taking random actions on that environment to see what it looks like. So if we run this now, should get a little pop-up, and you can see we're effectively playing breakouts. So again, it went really, really quickly. If we didn't want to close our environment, we can just comment out that last line and you're going to see it play. Now you can see it's sort of just playing randomly and it's not exactly getting the highest score. So it's what capping out at around two, four, it looks like the highest that it got was four. Now it gets a point for each block it breaks. So you can see that it got one, two, three in that case. We want to try to train a model that's able to play a little bit better. Now, again, training this model can take a long time. So we'll give it a crack and if you want to take this further, train it for longer, let me know how you go in the comments below. Now, what we're going to do here is a little bit different to what we did in the main tutorial, because what we're going to do is we're actually going to vectorize our environment and train four different environments at the same time. So let's go on ahead and test this out. Okay, there you go. So that's our environment at the moment. So now if we type in env.reset and <clears throat> env.render, you can see that we're actually playing with four different environments at once. So this means that when we actually go and train, we're going to be training four environments at the same time. So hopefully this should give us a little bit of a speed up. Now we can type in env.close to close that down. You can see uh, it doesn't look like it's closed down. In this case, let's try that again. Sometimes it's not going to want to close down and you're just going to have this force shut it, but I don't want to force shut it because sometimes it'll crash the kernel. That's fine for now. Just leave it open. So that is our environment now set up. So all well and good. Now what we can do is actually set up our model to actually go in ahead and train this. So let's do that and kick off our training. Oh, let's actually take a look at what we wrote to vectorize our environment. I completely skipped over that. So what I wrote was EMV equals make underscore Atari underscore EMV. And then to that, we pass through the type of environment that we want to run. So in this case, the environment that we're actually running is breakout dash V0. So this is the breakout game that we're actually working with. Now, a key thing to call out is if you actually take a look at the gym environments, there's actually a breakout RAM version and a breakout dash V0 version. So this one is gonna train using images. This one is actually gonna train using RAM. We want the image-based model because we're gonna be using a CNN policy. 
So then to that, we've also passed n underscore ENVs equals to four because we're gonna use four environments at the same time. And we're gonna specify seed as zero to get some reproducible results. Then what we've actually gone is we've gone and stacked those environments together. So to do that, we've written ENV equals VEC frame stack. So this is that wrapper that we imported up here. And then we've passed through our environment and we've specified n underscore stack equals four. So this basically stacks our environments together. Then we're going to go and specify a model. So let's go and do it. Okay, so that is our model now set up. So we've gone and written two lines of code there. So first up, we've written log underscore path equals os.path.join, and then we specified training and log. So again, this is similar to how we set up our log path in the main tutorial. Then we've gone and specified our model. So model equals A2C. So remember, we're just using a different model in this particular case. So this is the different algorithm that we're using. So rather than PPO or DQM. Then we've specified the type of policy that we want to use. This is a key differentiator. So previously we used the MLP policy, which is great for tabular data or tabular observations. But because our image and specifically our observations are an image in this case, our CNN policy is actually going to be a lot faster to train. So we've specified CNN policy. So this basically uses a convolutional neural network as part of the policy rather than just a multi-layer perceptron. Then we've gone and specified our environment, which is coming from here. Specified verbose equals one because we want logging. And we've also specified a tensorboard log path. Now, what we can go and do is go on ahead and train this. Now, we're going to train this for a little bit longer. So what I might do is might stop the training if it runs for too long. And then we'll actually um, load up one that I pre-trained and see how that performs. But for now, let's train this on about, let's give it 200,000 steps. So again, if you want to get a really, really high performing model, you might need to train up to a million or even 2 million steps. But let's give it 100,000 and see how long that takes. Ideally, we should be able to get a score higher than four from what you can see up here, which is just random actions. Okay, so no real difference there. So what I've written is model.learn and then pass through total underscore time steps. And we specified that as 100,000. So again, no different to what we did for our previous tutorial where we're training a model. So we're going to run this and we'll be right back. Okay, so you can see that our training is kicked off. So again, we'll let this train and then we'll be right back as soon as it's done. So it's going to train for 100,000 steps. So we'll give it a little bit of time. Okay, so that is our breakout model now finished training. So you can see that after 100,000 steps, we've got an episode reward mean or average episode reward of 5.84 and an episode length of about 479 frames. So not too bad overall. Now, what we want to do is save this model and reload it before we do anything else. So let's go on ahead and do that. Now, this is going to be really similar to how we've saved models before. So again, nothing too crazy there. Okay, so that is our model now saved. So if we go and take a look, so you can see that we've gone and saved A2C breakout model. Now I've also got an A2C model that's been trained for 300,000 steps for breakout. So if you wanted to take a look at that one, I'll include that in the GitHub repo as well. So you can take a look and try that one out. But in this case, we are going to test out our own model. So let's go on ahead and delete our model and then reload it just to make sure it all works. Okay, so that's our model reloaded. Now, again, what we can do is use the evaluate policy method, which we had over here to test it out. So remember that the max score that we got after testing out our five episodes up here was four. So ideally, this model should ideally try to get a little bit better than that. So let's try that out. So what we're going to do is we're going to use evaluate policy. And we're going to pass through our model, our environment, and then the number of eval steps. So we're going to do, let's do 10 and let's do render equals true. And let's take a look. You must only pass. Okay. So this is actually pretty common. So when we actually go and evaluate, we can only go and evaluate on a single environment. Now, remember correctly, when we went and created our environment, 
right up here. We had four environments, so we vectorized them and trained them a whole heap faster. Now, what we can do is we can actually single this down and leverage our vectorized model on a non-vectorized environment or an environment that only has a single particular environment inside of it. So let's go on ahead and create one of those first up. Okay, so we've now gone and recreated our environment. Now this time, rather than passing through four environments in our make Atari environment function, we've only passed through one, but we're still stacking it up as though that there's four environments. So this is going to allow us to leverage it. So now if we go and run our evaluate policy method, you can see it should all be running well. So you can see it's playing way better now. It's looking like it got a five, six, seven, six, they're so still playing way better than the random agent was. So you can see there that on average, we we're getting a value of 6.1 with a standard deviation of 1.9. Now, what we could also do is we could also test out that bigger model that I had in there. So again, I can't remember how well that was performing, but let's go on ahead and test that out. So the model path to that model is going to be a 2C 300K model. So we can copy that name and try loading that up. So I'm just going to update the A2C path and then load that one and then recreate our environment. You don't need to recreate it, but then let's try this one out. So if you get your environment sort of freezing like this, sometimes what you might need to do is restart your notebook. So you can see there that it doesn't look like it's um, opening up. So ideally what you should do is just hit restart on your kernel for this, but make sure you save down your model before you do this. I'm just going to hit restart, hit restart again. This should ideally close. Oh, we want to stop that. Yep. So that's good. That's from another kernel. Now what we're going to do is re-import our dependencies. So just import that and then scroll on down. And what we're going to do is define our A2C path, load up that model. Uh, we need to recreate our environment from down here then load up that model and then try it again. So there you go. So that looks like it's performing way better already. And you can see that this model, obviously it's been trained a lot longer, but it's getting into the tens and possibly the twenties when it's actually playing. So again, the longer that you train, the better that this model is actually going to get. Now you could also try using some of the recurrent policies, but at the moment they're not implemented in stable baselines three. I will let you know once they are in the pinned comment, but that sort of gives you an idea as to how you can go about training a reinforcement learning agent for breakout. Now what we'll do is we'll just clean this up. So if we type in env.close, that'll close our Atari environment. It's just this one left. So that is all well and good. So we went and did a ton of stuff here. So what we did is we went and imported our, our dependencies and we imported a couple of new ones to work with Atari. We also went and installed the Atari ROMs. So remember you got to download them from Atari Mania. And again, I'll include this link in the description below. We vectorized our environment. So rather than using a single environment, we trained on four. So this gives us a bit of a speed boost. And then we also went and trained it up and then we went and saved it and evaluated it at the bottom. And I also showed you the 300K model, which you can see here, it was getting an average score of 12.7 with a standard deviation of five. So overall it was better, but there was a higher standard deviation. So that sort of gives you an idea of what's possible by just training a little bit longer. Hey guys, editing Nick here. Before we jump over to the next project, I wanted to let you know that I ended up training the breakout model for an additional 2 million steps just to see what it would actually take a look like. Now, after training for around about 2 million steps, what we ended up with is an average reward around about the 20 point range. Now, this obviously is a markedly improved result over what we had in our original model. So ideally you can see the impact of training for longer. This is what it looked like. So as I was saying, I ended up training the model for a whole heap of additional time steps. So all up, I ended up training the breakout model specifically with the A2C algorithm for around about 2 million time steps. Now, when I evaluated this model, it looked like we were getting around about an average score of 21, which is again, still way better than our random model, still better than our 100,000 time step model. So you can start to see the impact of training for longer. Now, I'll also make this model available inside of the GitHub repository. So if you want to test it out for yourself, you can start to see what that actually looks like. So the model name is A2C underscore 2M model. So A2C trained for 2 million steps. So what we can do is as per usual, load this up into our environment. And what we'll do is we'll load it into our A2C algorithm. 
We'll create our environment that has a single frame at a particular time. And then rather than evaluating for 10 time steps, what we'll go on ahead and do is evaluate for 50. So what I'll do is I'll run this and then I'll leave you to it so you can start to see the boost in performance and then we'll come back at the end and take a look at what our end score was. So again, we're gonna run it for 50 evaluation episodes. So let's go on ahead and do this and you can take a look. So already you can start to see that this is performing way better. So we're clearing the tens, we're clearing the twenties and every now and then the ultimate score is hitting 30. So again, way better than what we had in our previous models. But again, I'll leave you to it so you can enjoy the performance and take a look at how it's actually running. Okay, so that is 50 episodes now done. So it looked like we actually cleared 50 around about halfway through there. So again, significantly better performance than our other two models. Now, if we actually take a look at our scores, you can see that our mean reward over 50 episodes is 22.22. So again, way better than the other models that we were taking a look at. And overall, our standard deviation was 9.1. So again, way better than what we were taking a look at before. And ideally this begins to show you what is possible when you go and train your model for a little bit longer. On to our next project. Now, that is project one now done. Now we're on to project two. So reinforcement learning for autonomous driving. So for this particular environment, we're going to be using the racing car environment. So this is trying to get a car to drive around a randomly generated racetrack. So let's go on ahead and take a look at this one. So again, still the same five steps that we're going to be going through, but in this case, slight bit different in terms of how we're gonna set it up. Now, the first thing to note is that in order to leverage the racing car environment, you do need to install Swig. So in order to do that, just take a look at installing Swig. And it's going to vary depending on whether or not you're installing on a Windows machine or on a Linux machine. So for Windows, I believe all you need to do is download the Swig file and then extract it and add it to your path. For a Mac, I believe all you need to do is use Homebrew to install it. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, so you can actually use Homebrew. So Brew install Swig. So way easier if you're doing it on a Mac. Cool. So once you've got Swig installed, so again, for Windows, you just download it, extract it, and then add it to your path. And then you should be good to go. For Mac, you just got to use Brew install. But again, if you need a hand with that, hit me up in the comments below. Then what we're going to do is install two new dependencies. So we're going to need the Box 2D environment, and we're also going to need Piglet. So let's go on ahead and install these. Oh, we've typed in Jim wrong. That should be Jim. Okay, all good. So what I've gone and written there is exclamation mark pip install gym and then inside of square brackets box 2D. So when using the racing car environment, you need to have box 2D installed. That's what the racing car environment is built on top of. So once you've got that installed, you should be good to go. And then we're also installing Piglet. So again, this is a dependency of that particular environment. 
Once that's done, all you need to do is again, import your dependencies. So let's go on ahead and do that. Alrighty, so we've gone and written five lines of code there. So the first line is importing OpenAI Jim as per usual. So import Jim. Then the second one is from stable underscore baselines three, import PPO. Next one from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot vec underscore ENV, import dummy vec ENV. So again, this is really similar to what we did over here in our main tutorial. So again, we're going to be wrapping up our environment exactly as we had down there. Then the next line is importing our evaluate policy function. And then last but not least, we're importing OS. Alrighty, now the next thing that we're gonna do is test out our environment as per usual. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, that is our environment created. So this is just a warning, so you can sort of ignore that. Now what we can do is take a look at our environment again. So emv.reset. So you can see that this is generating our track and we'll talk about that a little bit more. We can take a look at emv.actionspace as per usual. And you can see it's gonna be a box and we've got a three different values between minus one and one. If we take a look at our observation space. You can see again, it's gonna be a box and it's gonna be values between zero and 255 and it looks like it's gonna be an image. So 96 by 96 by three. So this means that we're gonna have an image to be able to go on ahead and train our racing environment. Now, if we type in env.render, we can take a look at the environment itself. You can see, uh, it's not popping up, let's bring it up. That's sort of what our racetrack looks like. So you can see that we've got the entire racetrack there. Now we're actually gonna test this out. So we can type in env.close. So env.render, I should probably talk about this a little bit more. So env.render allows you to render the actual environment that you're working in. So this is an optional thing. You don't need to render. Um, it does slow down training if you're rendering while you're training, but it gives you the ability to see your agent in action. Um, so we can type env.close to close that down. So that should close down that environment. So that's the old one. Cool, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on ahead and test out our environment again. So again, we can just copy this from our breakout tutorial. So what we can do is just copy this testing code and bring it in. And again, this is almost identical, right? So we can uncomment our env.close and go on ahead and run this. So this is going to test out our environment. So you can see that we're actually trying to drive this car along this racetrack. Now, ideally, you're gonna get more points the longer it stays on inside of the track and the more turns it does. Now, because this is just taking random actions, it doesn't actually know where the track is at the moment. So it's just gonna go straight. So you can see it's making a lot of movement. It's kind of performing okay, but it's not able to take the turn. So the first time it gets up to that turn, it's failing, right? All right, we don't need to watch. So you sort of get the idea. So the goal is to get this car to go around the racetrack. Now we can actually stop this and hit env.close to close it. It just sort of cleans it up. That's fine. We can leave that one open. And now what we're gonna do is go on ahead and train our model again. So again, same sort of process. This time we're gonna be using the PPO algorithm. So rather than using the other algorithm, we're gonna use a slightly different one. So let's go on ahead. Oh, so rather than using A2C, like we did for breakout, we're gonna use PPO here. So let's go on ahead and train up our model. We should also take a look at what the different actions are. So if we take a look, uh, what can we do? MV. Doesn't look like we've got it. Let's take a look at how, what we can find. So car racing environment, open AI gym. So let's take a look at what we've actually got here. If there's any documentation on the different actions, it doesn't look like it. So again, sometimes you're going to get better, better explanations of what's actually happening in different environments. It looks like we've got something here. So the raw, actually, this is useful. 
So the reward is minus, let's make this a bit bigger. So the reward is minus zero or negative 0.1 for every frame and plus 1000 divided by N for every track tile visited. So this means that for every track tile visited, you're gonna get plus 1000 divided by N, where N is the number total number of tiles. It says slightly confusing or complicated uh, reward function, but you sort of get the idea. So you get more rewards or you get more points for being able to go down each and every frame as long as you're on the tiles. So the game is solved when the agent consistently gets 900 plus points. So again, this is gonna take some time to be able to get to that point. Um, so remember, it's a powerful rear-wheel drive car. Don't press the accelerator. Some indicators are shown at the bottom. So we've got the true speed, four ABS sensors, the steering wheel position, and the gyroscope. So again, pretty cool. So we've got a whole bunch of information here. Now, you can see there that this one does have a finite set of reward statements, which dictate whether or not it's solved. So ideally, you want to get over 900 points. That's going to take a long time. So I trained for 438,000 steps, and I think I was getting in the realm of 50, 40 sort of points. So again, can take a while to solve. Now, what we're going to do in this case is, again, we're going to try to solve it and see how we go. So let's do that. So we're going to go and train our model. So we're going to instantiate our environment, and then we're going to go on ahead and train it. Okay, so that is our environment now set up. So we've gone and written env equals gym dot make and then environment name. And then again, we're wrapping it inside of our dummy vectorized environment wrapper because we're not actually going to vectorize this one. So again, pretty similar to what we did in the main tutorial. Then what we can go and do is set up our agent and our model. So let's do it. Okay, so that is our model set up. So again, we've gone and specified our logging path, and this is where we're gonna log out our tensorboard logs. So we've gone and written os.path.join, and then specified training, and then specified logs. So that's gonna be our directory. And then we've actually gone and specified our agent. So model equals PPO. So again, we're gonna be using the PPO algorithm here. And then we'll pass through CNN policy, pass through our environment, pass through verbose equals one, and specified the tensorboard log path. Now, again, we're going to train, but we're only going to train for 100,000 steps. You might want to train for a whole heap longer if you want to try to hit that 900 score. And if you do hit that 900 score, do let me know in the comments below and share it out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'd love to see it. So in this case, we are going to go on ahead and train our model for 100,000 steps. So let's go on ahead and do that. So again, to train our model, we're just going to write model.learn. So you're going to start to see there's a repeatable process to this. So you instantiate your environment, you create the environment, vectorize it if you need to, and then set up your model and then go on ahead and train it. So in this case, we're going to go on ahead and train it. So let's go on ahead, kick this off, and we will be right back. So let's just wait for the training to kick off successfully. And there you go. So you can see that we're starting to get our output from our algorithm. So we'll let that train for 100,000 steps and we'll be right back. Okay, so that is our self-driving racing car now trained. So again, we've gone and trained it for 100,000 steps, 100,352 to be exact. Now again, as per usual, what we're going to go on ahead and do is save our model and then test it out. So let's do it. Okay, so that's our model now saved. So what we've gone and written is PPO underscore path to set up our path variable. So in order to do that, we've written os.path.join and then specified that we want it in our training folder and then our saved underscore mod or saved models folder. And then we're gonna name it PPO driving model. And then again, we've used model.save to be able to go and save that down. So if we now take a look, we've now got this model here, PPO underscore driving underscore model. Now I've also got another model that I trained for 428,000 steps. So we'll take a look at that one as well. But for now, let's go on ahead and delete our model as per usual, just to double check this all works. And then let's load it back up. So model equals PPO.load, and then we're gonna pass through our PPO path and our environment. Cool, so that's all good. Now what we can do is go on ahead and evaluate as per usual. So let's go on ahead and do that. 
So we're going to pass through evaluate underscore policy, and then we're going to pass through our model, our environment, and then the number of steps. So we're going to do 10 steps, and then we are going to pass through render equals true. So it looks like our car is ripping it around the track, doing a bunch of donuts. So a key thing to note is that the car is high powered. So it doesn't always, so you can see it's going around the corner, but it's having a bit of trouble sort of getting there. This is great. So you can see that because the car is so high powered, it starts to lack traction. So in this case, it can get stuck in this loop. Whereas instead of actually driving forward, it just goes and does donuts. Okay, so it sort of gave up there. Got around the first corner. Uh, that spinned out. Okay, I think it's just going to keep doing this. So, all right. So that's sort of what 100,000 steps gets you. So not exactly the best uh, racing car driver. <laughs> just kind of fun. All right, cool. So let's stop this because it's clearly, uh, it's driving me insane that it's just going all over the place. And we're just going to type in env dot close. All right, so that's now closed. We've only got that one open. And rather than using that one, let's go on ahead and load up the one that I trained for, I think it was 438,000 steps, 428. So let's go on ahead and load up this model. And again, I'll make this model available in the GitHub repo. So I'm just going to change the name of the PPO path and then load this one up. And let's go on ahead and test with this model. So you can see it is a lot slower now, but it is at least sort of sticking to the track. It's just cut the corner. It's fine. It's back on. So you can see it's getting the score that it's getting is much higher. So it's, we're up to 190, 200. So ideally, you want to be able to get up to 900. So that means that it's going to have to accelerate off the turn. So this is obviously trained for 438,000 steps. So if you actually train for a lot longer, you'd get a car that actually rips it down the straights, takes the corners appropriately. In this case, it's starting to sort of, it's a little bit hesitant on the throttle, which you can see there. So it's, it's going, but it's maybe not going as fast as it could. There you go. It's just accelerated. It's back on track. There you go. But you can see that this is obviously way better than the one that we trained for 100,000 steps. So that sort of shows you the difference, the training for a lot longer. And I did nothing different apart from just train for a longer period of time. So again, when you're training these reinforcement learning agents, training for a longer period of time can obviously help you out a lot more and ideally produce a much better model. So ideally for this, I'd be looking at something in the realm of like a million to 2 million steps to be able to get something great. So if someone does have the time and if you do run it for that long, by all means, do let me know. If you'd like to see me do it, do hit me up in the comments below. I'd love to take a look at this again. But for now, that is our self-driving car sort of done. It is a little bit glitchy on the throttle, but you sort of get the idea. Now we can go on ahead and close this. So stop that environment and then run emb.close to close it. Now, again, remember in our main tutorial, we also went through the ability to test it like this. So rather than going through and using the evaluate policy, we could also do this as well. So if I copy step six from the main tutorial, we could actually plug this in. So in this case, we've got our environment. That's all good. Our model, that's all good. We could actually just test this out. So let's run it. There you go. So you can see rather than using evaluate policy, we're now using the, I don't know, what do you call it? Flow to be able to go and train this. And you can see the car's getting around turns. So we're up to what, 250 now? God, I don't know how you could watch this after too many times. It does get a little bit glitchy, but it's going around its corners. It's moving around. And keep in mind, we've only trained this on the image, right? So like we don't have any additional information, but the image that's actually coming out of this which is actually pretty cool, right? Let's get, oh, it actually took the corner. That's pretty cool. Come on. 270, not bad. So again, the, the, the max score to consider this solved is 900. So ideally you'd want to train it for a lot longer to be able to get this performing way better. And you can actually see our scores being logged down here. So 255, 181, 276, it just got 214. 
but this is obviously way better than what we had in that random agent, which was getting like negative values. Also, I noticed that if it veers too far off the track and it's not able to see the track anymore, it sort of gets stuck and just stops there. This is on the 438K model. But again, you could train it longer and you'd get better results. So that sort of gives you an idea as to how you can leverage reinforcement learning for autonomous driving and in this case, racing. Hey guys, editing Nick here again. So I also ended up training the self-driving tutorial for a whole heap more steps. Now again, I trained this model for about 2 million steps and this significantly improved the performance of this particular model. So in the actual tutorial, we got around in the range of about 200 to 300 in terms of our reward estimate. Now, when I went and trained it for a whole heap longer, we were heading towards the range of around about 700. Not quite completely solved based on the environment metrics, but ideally you can see again, it's performing a whole heap better. This is what that looked like. So as I was saying, I ended up training the self-driving model for a whole heap longer. All up, I ended up training it for 2 million additional steps. Now, the reason that I wanted to show you this is just so you can see the impact of training for longer. So this is obviously one technique that you can go about leveraging in order to improve the performance of your models. So again, all up 2 million steps, and I'll make this model available in the GitHub repository so you can pick this up. So if you cast your minds back, we had three different models all up now. So we trained the first model, which was just doing burnouts, was not really making it past the first corner. We had the second model, which was super jittery, and then we've got this model now as well. So I'll make this one available. So in order to load this one up, all I needed to do is again, similar to what we did for our previous models, I can just load it using the PP PPO path and model.load or PPO.load. And then we can go and run this model. Now, what you should see is that this model performs a whole heap better than the previous models. It'll still spin out on a corner every now and then, but again, it's getting a lot further and scoring a lot higher than those other models that we trained. So let's go on ahead and take a look at this one. So you can see there, it got up to about 800, so not too bad. So every now and then it's gonna lose focus and sort of veer off the track. But you can see it's performing a whole heap better than the other models that we had trained. So it'll spin out, but then it works its way back to the track and it eventually starts taking the corners pretty well again. So every now and then you'll see one that performs not so well, but you can see that this is performing significantly better than what we had before. So again, getting into the 700 range. And there we go, that was another 770 score. So you can see down the bottom again, when we're evaluating our model, what our performance is looking like. So if we bring that a little bit further up and open it up, uh, it doesn't look like we're printing out. So let's let these 10 episodes run and then you'll eventually see the total score or the automated sum of the results. So I'll be quiet now and I'll let you enjoy this. And that is all 10 episodes complete. So you can see that we had a significant boost in terms of our performance 
simply by training for longer. Now, if we actually take a look at the results of our evaluate policy, you can see that our final score down here, our average score over 10 episodes was 741. So again, not quite hitting that golden 900 mark, but again, still way better than what we had in our previous models. This also had a standard deviation of about 123. So again, a reasonably high standard deviation in this particular case. But this sort of shows you what's possible when you ideally go and tune your model and train for a little bit longer. On to our next project. Now, on that note, that is project two now done. Now, the last project that we're gonna be taking a look at is reinforcement learning for custom environments. Now, if you've watched my shower environment or shower custom environment tutorial, this is going to be that same environment, but we're going to be using stable baselines as the algorithms to be able to solve this. So without further ado, let's kick off project three. So again, all of these notebooks are going to be available inside of the GitHub repository. So if you want to pick these up, by all means, do grab them. Let me know how you go with them. And if you get stuck, please do reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help. So let's go on ahead and do this so there's a bunch of dependencies that we're going to be importing here namely because we're going to be defining our own environment in this case so let's go ahead and import these dependencies and then we'll take a step back and take a look at those Okay, so we've gone and written nine lines of code there. So there's quite a fair bit. Now, in this case, what I've gone and written is I've broken it up into three specific sections. So these are our gym dependencies or open AI gym dependencies. These are some of our helpers that we're going to need. And then down here, we've got our stable baseline stuff. So first up from gym, we're importing more than just the gym package this time. So we've written import gym, which is going to give us a pretty standard import. Then what we're doing is we're importing the gym environment class. So to do that, we've written from gym import env. So this is going to be the super class that we're going to be able to use to build our own environment. Then what we've written is from gym dot spaces import discrete box dict tuple multi binary and multi discrete. So each one of these represents all of the different types of spaces that are available inside of OpenAI Gym. So I wanted to sort of show you what each one of these different types of spaces looks like and how to actually use them. We'll probably only use the two common ones, discrete and box in our environment, but I wanted to give you an idea as to how these all fit together. Then we've gone and brought in some helpers. So we've imported NumPy, so import NumPy as NP. We've imported random, so import random. We've imported operating system, so import OS. And then we've gone and imported our standard stable baseline stuff. So from stable underscore baselines three, import PPO. From stable underscore baselines three, import common dot vec underscore EMV, import dummy vec env, again, pretty standard. And then we've imported our evaluate policy function. So again, this is really, really common. Most of this is pretty common and Jim is pretty common. The new stuff is these couple of lines here. So let's go and have a look at our different types of spaces so we've got a bunch that we've imported over here let's take a look at each one of these so first up is discrete so we can dive in discrete and then say we wanted three different actions we can do that so that's going to give us our discrete space now we can actually sample it and take a look at all the different types of values so again zero one and we should get up to two so you can see this is going to give you a value between 0, 1, and 2 by passing through discrete equals 3. So if you had an action and an action mapped or each one of those actions mapped to a specific value, so 0, 1, or 2, that's how you'd use that. Then we've got a box. So that's our box space. So to do that, we're in box, and then we've passed through 0, and then comma 1. So this is our low value. This is our upper value. And then this, this is the shape of the output that we're going to get. So we're going to get an array that's three by three. So ideally you'll have a list of lists. So if we take a look at that by sampling it. So again, you've got an array and inside of that array, you've got three individual arrays and those arrays have three values. So again, exactly the same formatting. So we've got those values between zero and one. So again, you might use this if you were trying to um, look at different types of sensors, or if you had continuous variables, you'd use a box. Now, again, if you just wanted three values, you could do that. 
And that's just gonna give you three values as well. So all I've done is I've reduced it into an array of three values. Then what we've got is a tuple. Now at the moment, stable baselines doesn't support a tuple, but if you wanted to use it, you could still take a look. So to that, we can pass through a discrete environment or a discrete space. And really your tuple space just allows you to combine different spaces. So if we do that, you can see our tuple is now combined of our discrete environment and our discrete box space. So if we sample it, you can see we're getting our discrete value first up and then we're getting our box second. Okay, on to our next one. So again, so far we've done discrete, box and tuple. Next one that we wanna take a look at is dict. So this is really similar to a tuple. The only difference is that rather than passing through a tuple to tuple, you pass through a dictionary. So let's do it. Okay, so that is our dict space. So what I've written is dict and then open braces. And then to that, we've actually passed through this dictionary here. Now this dictionary has two keys, so height, and then height is equal to discrete two. So really it's no different to typing in discrete two up here. And then we've created another key, which is speed. And we've set that equal to box. And then to box, remember you're gonna pass through three key arguments. So you're gonna pass through your lower value, your upper value, and then the shape that you want. So in this case, I've specified a shape of one comma, which means I'm only gonna get a single value back between the values of zero and a hundred. So if we actually go and sample this, you can see we've got our height key, which is represented as zero, because remember it's gonna be between zero, one, and two. And then we've also got our speed, which in this case is a value between zero and a hundred. Pretty cool, right? So that gives us our dict space. Now the next space that we wanna take a look at is multi-binary. So in order to create that space, we've just written multi-binary and then passed through the number of positions that we want in our multi-binary space. So multi-binary four is gonna give us four positions so we can go and sample it. And in this case, you can see that we've got zero, or one, two, three, and four positions. And in this case, it's going to be a binary set of values. So either zeros or ones. So if we go and sample it multiple times, you can see it's just different combinations of zeros and ones in those four positions. Cool. Now the last type of space that we want to take a look at is multi-discrete. So again, going to be pretty similar to multi-binary, except rather than being binary values, they're going to be discrete values between any value that we want now. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so that is our multi-discrete space. So to do that, I've written multi-discrete and then to that I've passed through a list and the values I've passed are five, two, and two. So if we go and hit sample. So again, you're going to get three different values and these values are going to vary depending on what parameters you've passed through to the list. So because I've passed through five, the first value is gonna vary between zero and four. Because I pass through two, it's going to vary between zero and two. Actually, is this going? Let's actually take a look. I believe max it's going to get up to, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be zero to four and then zero to one and then zero to one again. So again, this is the upper cap. So it starts at zero. Cool, so we can keep going through that and you can sort of see what happens. So if we go and pass through another value now, we're just gonna get another discrete value appended onto the end of that. So that's really a summary of all the different types of spaces that you've got available inside of OpenAI Gym. So you've got a discrete space, a box space, tuple, dict, multi-binary, and multi-discrete. So discrete is when you'd have a discrete number of actions and those map through to a single integer. Box gives you continuous variables. So remember with your box, you just pass through your lower value, your upper value, and then the shape of the box that you actually want. Your tuple allows you to combine different types of spaces together as a tuple, but is not currently supported by stable baselines. So something to keep in mind. So remember to your tuple, you just pass through a set of braces and then the two different types or whatever types of spaces you want. So we've passed through discrete here and then box here as well. So again, this is inside of braces there. Then we've got our dict space. So again, to our dict, we just pass through our dictionary of different types of spaces. So we've got our discrete and we've also got our box space there. We've got our multi-binary space. So again, we've got that. Now, keep in mind, you could actually grab that multi-binary space and add it to your tuple as well. So if we do that, uh, we are just in there. So again, now we've gone and added another type of space to our tuple. So again, we could do this with our dict. So say, for example, I could call this um, color, I don't know. 
So again, you can add multiple versions to the two point deck. They're sort of like drooping spaces, right? Uh, so we've got multi-binary and then to that you pass through the number of positions that you want in your binary space and we've also got multi-discrete and this gives you a bunch of different discrete types of values. So again, there's not a lot of documentation out there on these. So I figured I'd do a little bit of a crash course on them. If you'd like to see more on that, by all means do hit me up in the comments below. But now we're going to be building our own environment. Now, the goals of this environment are to basically build an agent to give us the best shower possible. Now, what's going to happen is randomly, uh, the temperature is going to fluctuate because there's other people in the building. So it's going to randomly go up and down. Now we know that our optimal temperature is between 37 and 39 degrees. So we want to be able to train an agent to automatically respond to changes in temperature and get it within that 37 and 39 degrees uh, range. Now keep in mind that our agent doesn't actually know that we prefer our temperature to be within 37 and 39 degrees. So it's going to need to learn what types of adjustments it can make to get it to within that range. Just something to keep in mind. So remember, this is a simulated environment. So our agent doesn't actually know how it accumulates its reward. It just knows that by doing certain actions, it's gonna get a reward. Now we know it, we wanna get it between 37 and 39, but our agent doesn't. So let's go on ahead and build this environment. So there's a few different functions that we need to implement in this environment to get it valid. So let's go on ahead, let's build a shell and then we'll fill it out. Okay, so at a high level, that is our shower environment. Now, we obviously haven't gone and implemented the different components into it, but these are the four key functions that you need to have inside of your shower environment class. So let's take a look at what we've got so far. So what I've gone and written is class, and then inside of capitals or camel case, I've got shower ENV, and then to that, we're passing through our ENV class, which is from our gym environment up there, and then colon. Then we've got four different functions that we've gone and implemented. So we've got the init function, so which triggers when we create our class, the step function, the render function, and the reset function. So to do that, we've written def underscore underscore init, and then to that, we're passing through self inside of pair of brackets, and then a colon. And then right now we've just written pass. This allows us to define it without having any errors for now. Then we've defined a step function, so def step, and then to that we'll pass through self and then we're passing through the action that we're actually going to pass through to our environment. So remember when we use env.step, we pass through our action and it actually does something. Then we've gone and defined a render function. So def render and then to that we'll pass through self and then colon and then pass. So we're not going to do anything in our render function for now. I actually, as part of building this course, I actually built out a giant or started building out a giant pie game environment, but it was sort of blowing out of proportion so if you'd like to see a video on reinforcement learning for gaming which involves building a custom environment using pygame please do let me know in the comments below i'd love to hear your thoughts and then our last function is reset so def reset and then to that again we're going to be passing through self colon and then right now we've got pass so let's go on ahead and initially set up our init function and then we'll keep going Okay, that is our initialization function now done. So we went and wrote four lines of code there. So first up, we defined our action space. So to do that, we wrote self dot action space, and we set that equal to discrete three. So remember, this is no different to saying discrete three. And the three actions that we're going to have are whether or not we turn the tap up, whether or not we turn the tap down, or whether or not we leave the tap unchanged. So this basically gives us three discrete actions. Now you could change this and have it actually as a box type action space where you actually turn the tap by a certain amount or by a certain number of degrees. But in this case, we're gonna keep it pretty simple and say up, down, or hold. Then we've gone and defined our observation space. So to do that, we've written self.observation underscore space equals box. 
and then we've set it to equal to two NumPy arrays. So in this case, we've got a low value. So low equals MP dot array and then pass through zero. And then we've gone and specified a high value. So high equals MP dot array. And then to that we've passed through the number hundred. So this means that our observation space, let's actually extract that so we can take a look. So this means that our observation space is going to be a value between zero and 100 and have the value of one. So if we type in dot sample, we can do that. So you can see that that's going to be the value that we get back. Now we can actually change this. So we can just make it zero and a hundred and pass through shape equals one comma. That should ideally give us the same type of output. So delete that. So there you go. So same sort of output. And if we type in dot sample, Again, we're going to get the same type of output. So again, two different ways of defining it. In this case, I've just swapped it out, but you can sort of see that you've got multiple ways of defining that box space. Then we've gone and defined our initial state. So this is going to set our initial state. So we'll set that equal to 38 plus a random integer between minus three and three. So this means that our shower is going to start out at 38 degrees plus or minus three. And the goal of our agent is going to be to get it within that magic range of 37 and 39 degrees now we've also set another variable so this is going to effectively represent our episode length in this case it's our shower length so we're only going to shower for 60 seconds it's a fast shower i know so what we've gone and written is self dot shower underscore length equals 60. so what we're going to do inside of our step function is decrease that by one second every time we go through and take an action so let's go on ahead and now define our step function Okay, so we've now gone and filled out our step function. So in this particular case, what we've got is, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, six different code blocks. So the first one is applying the impact of our action on our state. So remember we had three different actions. So zero, one, or two. So zero is going to represent decreasing the temperature of our shower by one degree. One is going to represent no change, and then two is going to represent increasing the temperature of our shower by one degree. So in order to do that reasonably simply, we've written self.state plus equals the action minus one. So remember, our action is going to be discrete, what was it, three? So if we go and sample that, so in this case, we've got one. So by minusing one, we're going to get the value. So actually, let's actually print it out. So in this case, if we take the action of one, that is going to be akin to leaving the temperature the same. So if we minus one, again, it's going to apply zero change to our temperature. So self.state is going to stay the same. If we get a different value, so say for example, we get two by minusing one, which is what we're doing here, we're going to increase the temperature of the shower by one degree. And if we get zero, we're effectively going to be subtracting one. Cool. So now the next thing that we've gone and done is then decrease the shower time so every time we take a step or take an action we're going to decrease the length of our shower by one so remember we defined it up here initially to 60 seconds you could change this to something different if you wanted to so we've gone and defined self dot shower underscore length minus equals one so that's going to decrease it and then this is really really important so this is where we actually define our reward so again if you had a really complicated reward schema this is where you'd be doing it so what we've gone and done is we've written if self.state, so remember state is our temperature, is greater than or equal to 37. So remember the magic ratio, it's got to be between 37 and 39 degrees. And self.state is less than 39 degrees, then the reward is one. In all other cases, so say for example, if our shower is completely out of that range, our reward is going to be negative one. Now you could also make the reward zero as well. 
then what we're also doing is we're checking whether or not our shower is done because if our episode is done, then we want to stop that particular episode. So if self.shower underscore length is less than or equal to zero, then done is set to true. Let's fix that. We've gone and screwed that up. Then else done equals false. So again, if it's not, if we haven't fully consumed the 60 seconds, then our shower is not done. Then we're creating a blank info dictionary. So if we wanted to pass additional stuff out of here, we could do that in there. And then out of this, we're returning our self.state, which is going to be our temperature, our reward for that particular episode, whether or not we're done, and our info. So again, out of this, we're returning all of these bits of information that we've gone and calculated in our step function. Now, in this case, our render function, we're not actually going to do anything in here. So we could implement viz if we wanted to. We're not going to do anything there, but if you wanted to, you definitely could. Then the last function that we need to implement is our reset function. Key thing to note is that if you wanted a more detailed tutorial on how to implement render and again, Pygame, I'd love to do something on that. And if you've got a specific use case, hit me up in the comments below, because I'd love to hear some ideas as well. In this case, let's go ahead and wrap up this environment. So for our reset function, we just need to reset our initial temperature and we also need to reset our shower time to 60 seconds. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, I think that is our environment now done. So for our reset function, what we're effectively doing, we could actually potentially drop this self.state up here because we're going and reinitializing it inside of our reset, but that's fine for now. So what we've gone and written is self.state equals np.array. And then to that, we're passing through our same random initialization function. So inside of a set of square brackets, we've passed through 38 degrees plus random.randint between minus three and three. So again, you could choose a broader random initialization if you wanted to. In this case, I've just chosen three. And then we've specified as type float because remember our box is going to be, we haven't specified that it's going to be an integer. We could do that as well. So you could specify D types. In this case, we're going to leave it as a float. Now, what we're also doing is we're resetting our shower length to 60. So self.shower underscore length equals 60. And then we're returning our self.state. So that should be our environment all well and good now. Now, what we can do is we can actually test out this environment. So EMV equals shower env and then we can run env.observation space as per usual and you can see we're getting our box back and if we type in dot sample this is our initial temperature and if we keep doing that you can sort of see that there and we can type in env.action space and again we've got our discrete space dot sample and there you go. So you can see that we've gone through the breakout tutorial, the self-driving tutorial, and you're probably thinking how are these spaces built? Well, this is exactly how they're done. When you're dealing with gaming implementations, there's a lot more work done around the render, around the observation space, as well as around the reward space, because it's a little bit more sophisticated. And again, if you'd like to see that done, let me know. I've started, I've already got the template code sort of built. Love to do your tutorial if you guys are interested. Now, in this case, what we're actually going to go on ahead and do is test out our environment and train it as per usual. So again, what we can go on ahead and do is let's just copy the exact same testing code that we used for our driving tutorial, which is this here. And this is under step two, test environment. We can actually paste this here. Now, the cool thing is that we've actually gone and defined an environment to a state that we can actually use it as part of a template code. So if we go and run this, you can see that it's automatically gone and smashed through all of those episodes. So it's got our score printed out. Now, remember our score is going to increment by one if we've got the shower between 37 and 39, and it's gonna decrease by one if it's outside that range. So you can see that just by running those five episodes, we've got a high score of 26 and the lowest of minus 60. So again, we can keep running this and you can see it's very quick. And this is because we don't have a sophisticated render function and it's just, uh, it's all text-based. So again, it's going to go very, very quickly. Now, in this case, what we're going to go on ahead and do is train our model and then save it so you can sort of see how to do this on a custom environment. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, so we've gone and initialized our model and it's automatically wrapped it inside of the dummy vec env. So even though we've gone and imported it over here, 
looks like it's automatically wrapped it. So we're good to go. So we've written log underscore path equals os.path.join and then to that we've passed through training and then log. So remember, it's going to follow that same sort of logging directory that we set up. And then we specified model equals PPO, pass through the policy that we want to use, in this case, MLP policy. This is different because in our breakout tutorial and our self-driving tutorial, we had an image returned. Now we've got sort of tabular data or tensor-based data, or actually, well, is sort of the same, but we've actually got a array of values rather than an image. So we're going to use the MLP policy. Then we're passing through our environment, specifying verbose equals one, and then specifying a tense board a log path. Cool. Now the next thing that we need to do is just go on ahead and train. So again, this is going to train really, really quickly. So you don't need to do a super long training uh, run. So let's just try it out. So model dot learn to train and then total time steps. I don't know. Let's set this to 4,000, for example. So let's go on ahead, kick this off and let it train. So this should train reasonably quickly because again, it's using an MLP policy and it's all tabular data. Um, and you can see the frames per second is 500. That, that's actually done. So it literally went that quick. So let's actually run it for longer. So rather than 4,000, let's give it 40,000. All right, so you can see that that's now running. It's doing about 600 frames per second, so really, really quickly. And that's one thing to call out. So with the game environments, they're going to take longer to train versus like a simple environment like this. So again, the more sophisticated the environment, the longer it's going to take to train. So just sort of keep that in mind when you're planning your projects and when you're sort of committing to clients when you're building this type of stuff. And again, if you need help, by all means, do call me out. I'm more than happy to help. And you can start to see that we're getting our episode reward mean. So in this case, minus 28.2, minus 25.9. So it looks like it's dropping. So should ideally get into the positives, minus 21.7, minus 14.9, it's getting close, minus 16.9. And again, the episode length mean is going to be the same pretty much all the time. It's going to be 60 seconds because that's the maximum, remember? Might need to train this for a little longer. Looks like it's getting close, but it's not into the positives yet. All right, it's so minus 15.5. Let's actually give it another... I don't know, 20,000 steps. Let's run that. So minus 4.12. So again, you can see it's starting to get close into the positives. Minus 5.18, 9.8. Let's let that run and we'll be right back. Okay, so it got pretty close. It's episode reward mean over here got to about minus 4.22. So I guess this depends on the starting point and how the model actually develops from there. So let's actually go and test it out and see how we actually go. So again, we can use evaluate policy here. Oh, we should save our model. So model.save. Let's define our path. Uh, what are we going to call this shower model? Let's just double check our directory name again. So it's training saved models. So let's specify that. And we're going to call this shower model. PPO. Cool. So we can type in model.save shower path. And again, if we go and take a look, that should be do, 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 shower model underscore PPO. So again, that is now saved. So we're good. Again, we can delete our model. And if we wanted to reload it, we can just type in model equals PPO dot load, pass through our path, pass through our environment. And then if we wanted to test it out, we can run evaluate policy, pass through our model, pass through our environment, pass through the number of eval episodes. And we don't need a render this time because we don't have a render function. So if we type in render equals true, should throw an error. It might actually not throw an error because we've got the... What did we have? Because we've got pass, so we're all good. Now, in this case, we've got a mean episode reward of 12 with a standard deviation of 58.78. So again, it's getting there, but it's it's got wide variance. So again, you could train this for a whole lot longer, tighten up the environment, make it a little bit more realistic than only being able to adjust up, down, and sort of steady state. But that sort of gives you an idea as to how to bring this all together. So in this tutorial, we went through a bunch of stuff as well. So we took a... So we imported all of our dependencies. We took a look at all of our different types of spaces. So remember there's a discrete space, box, tuple, dict, 
multi-binary and multi-discrete. And just keep in mind that stable baselines doesn't support tuples yet. We also took a look at how to build our environment. So remember, we had to define our init function, our step function, our render function, and last but not least, our reset function. And then again, in terms of testing and training and saving the model, it's all very much the same. But again, if you've got a really sophisticated model that you'd like to build, by all means, hit me up in the comments below. I'd love to help you out. And if you do build some really cool environments, do let me know. I'd love to see them as well. On that note, we have now finished project number three. So it comes to our wrap up. So hopefully you've enjoyed this course. So in it, we've gone and covered a whole heap of stuff. And remember the core purpose of this course is to bridge the gap between a lot of the theoretical stuff that you see floating around there in terms of reinforcement learning and show you a practical set of implementation steps. So we went through RL in a nutshell and talked about what reinforcement learning is and how it works. We took a look at how to set up our environment with stable baselines. We then went and built and took a look at some different types of environments using open AI gym in step number two. We then went and trained a model. We then went and tested and evaluated it. So we took a look at how we can view it inside a tensor board. We then extended out some of our algorithms and specifically we went and implemented callbacks. We went and used different algorithms. Remember we all up, we used PPO, A2C and we used a DQN algorithm as well. We even went and changed our policy architecture. So again, some pretty cool stuff happening there. And then we went through our three different projects. So remember, we went and trained a model to play breakout. We went and trained a model to race a car around a racing track. And we also went and built our own custom shower environment. So all up, we did quite a fair bit. Now, I want to leave you with some additional resources. So if you haven't gone through David Silver's reinforcement learning course, I'd highly recommend you do. His team are the team behind DeepMind and the guys that actually built the AlphaGo model. So obviously, super smart dude. Got some awesome theory for floating around there. And by all means, I do recommend you check it out. There's also a great book called Reinforcement Learning and Introduction by Richard Sutton and Andrew Bardos, some of the pioneers in the reinforcement learning field. I highly recommend you go and check those that book out. It's got some awesome stuff in it as well. Now, in terms of what to learn next, I love it when people give me ideas as to where to go from here. And I want to give you the same. So one of the things that we didn't cover in this course is hyperparameter tuning. So one of the ways that you can improve how you train your models is to tune the hyperparameters that you start and you progress your algorithms with. So again, that might be something that you take a deeper look into. And if you'd like to see a tutorial on that or a course on that, by all means, do hit me up. Building detailed custom environments. For example, we talked about this a little bit in terms of implementing a render function with Pygame, as well as integration with other simulation systems like Mujoko and Unity. And then last but not least, I think one of the coolest things that you could potentially take a look at learning is how to do an end-to-end -end implementation. So say, for example, you actually went and built a cart pole robot and actually got, went and trained in a simulated environment and then implemented it on a real environment perhaps using a Raspberry Pi based robot. I think that'd be an awesome thing to go and take a look at next. But on that note, that about wraps it up. Hopefully you've enjoyed this and thanks again for tuning in. Peace. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell and let me know any feedback or anything that you'd like to see going on from this. And if you get stuck at all, by all means, do hit me up in the comments below. I'm happy to help you out. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace.